Today, we will jump into one of the most mind-blowing and mind-wrecking blue lock arcs, and I'm of course talking about the Neo Egoist League arc. And I know that this arc is far from finished, but I thought that it would be nice to go over all of the amazing things which have already happened in this arc. So without further ado, be sure to subscribe to the channel, and let's dive right into the start of the Neo Egoist League arc. We start the Neo Egoist League arc off with Rin sitting on the shore that he and Sei used to visit. He looks at his phone and sees how much criticism Sei is getting for his last play in the U20 match. Rin then thinks back to that exact moment and says that he definitely had the upper hand there. Rin's offense kept up closely with Sei's when he obeyed his instincts of wanting to destroy him completely and then managed to stop his last play. However, even though he won, he still don't really understand that new side of him. It felt new but at the same time, nostalgic, almost like his veins were dancing. And on top of that, it seemed like Sei knew that part of Rin. Rin starts to wonder if this was his plan all along, and that Sei always wanted him to bring out this ego. However, none of it matters, as he only recognized Asagi in the end. Anyone can tell at a glance in that match, that Asagi gained everything, while Rin was one step short. As Rin is looking out at the sea, he's determined to change, and give it his all to destroy both Isagi and Sei. After that, we get to join the household of the Yoichi family, who is proudly replaying Isagi's interview over and over again. As they are getting ready to eat, Isagi's mom asks if life at Blue Lock isn't too difficult for Isagi, and that he's really evolved since joining the program. His dad agrees, and says that even though they don't know a whole lot about football, they are still extremely proud over Isagi. However, if Isagi wins or not isn't their biggest concern, as what makes the two of them glad is seeing Isagi happy. They don't care if he scores or even wins or not, as they will always be there for him, and only wishes him to live his life as he wants to, which makes Isagi extremely happy, as he says that from now on, he will become the best in the world. After dinner, he goes upstairs into his room. He thinks if living the life that you want is what it means to be an egoist. Even though Blue Lock helped him become something that he could never imagine, he still had to leave behind plenty of things and people. In Blue Lock, Isagi was able to learn the excitement of victory and the pleasure of scoring, the happiness of changing the world with his own hands. He sits up in his bed and says that he will do whatever to stay in Blue Lock. Just then, he gets a notification from Blue Lock, telling everyone to get back and to let the next act begin. We can also see Gagamaru just chilling in the woods as he gets his invitations, which is just so hilarious. The next day, all of the players arrive and lets the Blue Lock Project Phase 2 start. As they walked into the building, they are greeted by a bunch of players, kind of like how they were greeted in the first selection arc. But this time, it isn't just the Blue Lock players, as the former U20 players are here too. Isagi asks Aiku why they are here, and Aiku tells him that Ego asked them to. And I love how the first thing Naru and Bachira do is greet each other really happily. It's so cute. After that, Isagi spots Rin against the wall. He goes forward to greet him and says that it wouldn't be Blue Lock if he wasn't there. However, Rin tells him to stop talking to him and asks if he wants to get stabbed. However, before they can go any longer, the bowl cut himself pops up on the screen. He says that from now on, he holds the power of deciding every member of Japan's U20 team, and since he figured that even the losers might have their uses, he decided to invite them as well. Ego says that there are 100 days left before the U20 World Cup, and if they were to take part in it now, it would be simply impossible. Even so, it's not lost just yet as he says that he's come up with a way to allow them all to evolve at a rapid pace but before that, he has his annual quiz time and asks them what the cause for their improvement was. Awakening your ego, becoming aware of your innate weapons, the reason all of that happened was without a doubt due to this environment, this special yet cruel enclosed space called Blue Lock, and to be able to rise to greater heights, a new environment will be needed and that's why Ego has decided to throw them into the hottest hellfire that exists because in Blue Lock's Phase 2, they will all be thrown into the peak of the world, which is of course, Europe's big five leagues. Popularity, ability, and money in these European pro football leagues are at the peak of all these things. Among these five countries, each of you is going to choose which environment you want to sharpen yourselves in. But before they can start choosing their league, Ego will give his judgement regarding each league starting with England. A league characterised by speed and physical battles, where goals are stolen by the law of physical prowess. Next up is Spain, a league where technique and creativity are desired, their citizens won't get satisfied by just seeing goals. It's a place that gathers footballers who want to express creativity and playfulness. After Spain, we have Italy, a league that favours slyness and tactics. They hold history in being able to win 1-0 while holding their defence. 
A playstyle that fuses individual strength with robust team organization was born here. After them comes France, which is a league that acts as a gateway to success for newcomers and young players. In recent years, their market has received a grand lot of investments, so the money flows constantly. They're currently in a great spot in becoming the greatest league in the world. And to end it all, we have Germany, a league that fundamentally understands that football is a sport that you win by scoring the most goals. They favor getting to victory by logical and rational means. And on top of that, the player who currently holds the title of the best striker in the world and Isagi's idol Noel Noah is here. After that, Ego tells them that the survival battle in the new environment you select will double as the final selection for the U20 World Cup as well. And with such an environment being the highest peak of the world, the one thing that will be the key to winning your place among the best will be demonstrated using your uniqueness. Their talents and weapons may have stood out here in Japan, but they will fall to the average level when compared to the world. So what you felt then and what you believe in will serve as a test, and if even then you're still able to show you have value that no one else does, then the world will be waiting for you. This next step they are about to take is a rite of passage to becoming a professional. Therefore, they must accurately visualize what they want to become and then choose the best environment for themselves. For better or worse, this choice is guaranteed to completely derail your life. And then, with 90 minutes left, it was time for them to make a choice that will completely change their life. Igarashi has decided that he wants to go to Germany, Otoya is going to Spain, Aryu is headed to Italy, and Zantetsu has decided on France, and I really hope that we get to see more from him in this arc because I feel like he's a really underrated character who deserves more love. Jigiri looks over at Isagi and asks if he's decided. Isagi says that this is also for national teams, so they have to choose a pro league that they want to learn from, but even then he isn't quite sure. He says that he's been watching a lot of English leagues recently, but as a kid, he always wanted to go to Germany because of Noah. After that, Isagi asks Chigiri if he has decided on a club, and he has decided on England as he wants his own speed to be tested. Rio overhears them and says that they will be going together as he also chose England because he's fond of a lot of teams there and it also smells like money. Isagi turns around and asks Nagi if he's decided, and he says that he wants to go to the league which Bergkamp is in. However, Chigiri tells him that he's already retired, but tells Nagi that he played with England, and because of that, he's also ready to choose England. After that, Bachira comes and says that he's chosen Spain not to anyone's surprise. However, he says that it doesn't really matter anyway. Isagi is confused and asks what Bachira means. Bachira tells him that he's set on becoming the best striker in the world, so no matter what environment he experiences, all that matters is that he gets to wherever the top is. It's not a matter of making the right choice and instead making a path for himself, telling Isagi that what he trusts most isn't logic but his instinct. However, as he leaves, he says that even if they go different paths, it's common courtesy to have evolved by the next time they meet, which is quite sweet. Anyway, thanks to Batira's words, Isagi has chosen to follow his instincts too and chooses the place which will make his blood boil the most, and that's none other than Germany. After that, the Germany players move in with each other and we get a look at who chooses to go the German path. And it's the following Igarashi, Yukimiya, Hiroi, Raichi, Gagamaru, Nehru, Corona, Kiyora, and of course Isagi. By the way, a hot take. I would love to see more of Kiyora, as he seems like such a cool character. So I really hope that they show him off more and at least something in this arc. Anyway, the players enters a dark room and sees a hologram of Ego. Ego says that the team that's currently the strongest in Germany is Bastard Munchen, and they will get the opportunity to play with the team's U20 players and train with them. Igarashi is hyped that they will be going to Germany, however Ego stops him in his tracks and says that the environment of the big five European leagues will be recreated right here in Blue Lock. And to serve that purpose, he's invited players their age, who currently plays for the strongest teams in five big leagues, from England's Mansion City, Italy's Ubers, Spain's FC Barca, France's Paris X-Gen, and Germany's Bastard Munchen. The Blue Lock player's next goal will be to win in this environment, and the one who will be guiding you all won't be Ego himself, but instead the ace strikers who reign over each of these top teams. The blue lock players are able to see silhouettes of the players as Ego introduces the ace of Bastard Munchen and the master striker Noel Noah. Ego says that thanks to the result of the match with Japan's U20, blue lock has gained the attention of the entire world and this pipe dream of his has caught the attention of greedy sponsors which has made phase 2 better than he could have imagined. But all of this isn't just limited to Germany as a master striker has been gathered in each stratum. After that, he introduces all of the Master Strikers starting with England's Chris Prince, 
who is considered to be a striker on par with Noah. Spain has got Lavinio, the genius dribbler of Spain's league. From Italy, we have Snuffy, who is said to be Uber's secret to success. And not to mention Francis Loki, the number one supernova who football fans around the world have their eyes on. They'll each guide their players on their own philosophy, and they will all evolve in that environment whether they want that or not. So how will this work, you may ask? Well, firstly, you will train under the master to then possibly be chosen for the regulars, so you really must show your value to be chosen for a team mixed with the 11 members that were brought from the original team. After that, the 11 chosen will play in matches where the opponents will be the other teams, and therefore a league will be formed with those five teams and you will have the chance to fight against new players, but also teammates who chose different leagues. In the matches, there are some rules, for example, it's the first to three goals that win, and two infinite substitutions exist. And now the most exciting feature of them all is that the masters are allowed to sub in for three minutes. Even though this is extremely hype for the players, they can't forget that this is the final selection for the team that's going to the U20 World Cup. And depending on how the matches go, after each one of them, the ranks could completely change. Ego says that this is exactly what he's been dreaming of. A fight to create the best striker in the world, calling it a battle for survival in the new generation and the creation of a football never seen in history before. Isagi is stunned to get the chance to learn from Noah himself, and even playing with him will definitely help him reach new levels. He's now on the path of becoming the best striker in the world. However, before he can calm down, Ego says that he forgot to say something. He says that on Bastard Munchen's team, there's going to be another player who he just had to personally include. All of the blue lock players that are already here have taken the proper path. However, Ego also prepared a hidden path for those who were defeated and forced different philosophies upon them and he's now chosen to bring back the monster born out of that path. The doors open and he calls out the only survivor of the wild card and the final dark horse, which is none other than the man himself, Kunigami Rensuke. And with that, blue lock phase two can officially begin. As Ego leaves, he says that he leaves everything to Noah, and just then, some sort of door opens up to what looks like a cybernetic world. Noah tells them in Germany to proceed to the goal and that he will be waiting there as he leaves them. The blue lock players quickly understand that they will have to race against the German players to see who arrives faster. Isagi goes forward to Kunigami and says that he knew that he would come back and says that it's nice to have the superhero here. However, Kunigami tells him to quit it and that he doesn't call himself that childish name anymore as he tells Isagi to get ready because the one who will be the best in the world will be him. Isagi is shocked to see Kunigami so changed, however he can't do anything else but to fight. And then the training starts. They start with some running and Isagi notices that Kunigami is much faster now and that his physical specs are way higher now. As they come to the second zone, they have to sprint up a very steep road. Isagi is amazed at how the German players can keep up with this and wonders if they really are the same age as them. Even so, he's determined to not fall behind as he gets through zone 3 easily. However, in zone 4 he's facing some problems as he's having a hard time keeping up and says that the only one able to keep up is Kunigami. Just then, he sees that someone named Kaiser has already finished. He arrives at the final zone and will do everything to prove his worth. He gets behind the hinders easily and aims at the highest score possible. But just as he shoots, he hears someone speaking in German saying that he's been waiting to meet Isagi. He shots the ball at Isagi's ball and no not dose balls. Isagi is amazed that he managed to block his shot. But just then, the mysterious man introduces himself as Kaiser, who does the impossible, as he tells Blue Lock to kneel for him. Just unfortunate that Isagi didn't understand any of that as he was speaking in German. Isagi recognizes Kaiser right off the bat as one of the new Gen 11. But just then, someone else comes. He tells Kaiser that they can understand him and gives the blue lock players a special Mictro interpreter, which is a gift that helps them understand each other. After that, when they can understand each other, the guy introduces himself as Alexis Ness. But the blue lock players are to focus on their headphones and notice that they are built by Rio's family. Suddenly, someone else joins in. It's Eric Gesner who tells Ness to stop being so polite and that they are only here because they were told that Blue Lock was amazing. After that comes Benedict Grimm, who's acting like he's in a school play, kind of like Are You actually. After that, Isagi looks away for less than one second, but just as he does so, Kaiser drags him closer to him as if he were in a K-drama. He tells Isagi that he came here to meet him, Blue Lock's own ace striker, and tells Isagi to not disappoint him. Isagi tries to get free, but then Kaiser uses his full force to what it looks like pin Isagi against the wall. He tells Isagi to shut his mouth and to give him a reason not to feel like coming here was a waste of time, saying that he wants Isagi to get into his life. Finally, Isagi agrees and says that he will do as Kaiser says. 
he will gladly destroy his life. Kaiser then asks Ness to give him a tissue as he owns him or something. Anyway, Ness asks Kaiser what Isagi's title would be. Kaiser says that until he takes his place on the stage as the world's best striker, and now that he's stuck in this jock of an interlude called Blue Lock, the other players are the circus animals that provide some entertainment, but when he takes the stage it makes Isagi into the pathetic clown who thought he was the star. But just then, Noah comes and tells Kaiser to knock it off, calling it childish. Kaiser tries to argue, but Noah tells him to not talk back, and that it's him that makes the rules here. After that, Noah says that their initial training is done. Noah states that this room was designed to measure their physical abilities, due to Bastard Munchen's philosophy being that of extreme rationality. Noah doesn't put any stock on the invisible powers known as impression or emotion, but instead only thinks with logic and numbers, saying that the 21 players here will be ranked based on training and gameplay data, which will give the top 11 the chance to play in the next match. Isagi realizes that this is a game of data survival, where numbers are everything. He also says that he's in a pinch due to him being rock bottom on the leaderboard. None of the blue lock players manage to snatch a place in the top 12, or except one, the newly founded weapon Kunigami, who got a third place in the rankings, followed by Ness in second place and Kaiser in first. Even though Isagi is at rock bottom, he's determined to rise through the ranks to then drag down Kaiser from his throne. After that, Isagi and the players start their training. They only have 10 days left until the first match and have to follow Noah's designated training every day. Not to mention that each time the ranking changes, they swing between hope and fear as they battle to get into the top 11. Isagi knows that he won't get to play unless he can make it into the top 11, so he's got no choice but to keep up with them, so that he one day can dethrone Kaiser. After training, they head back to their room, and Yukimiya asks if Kunigami has told them about what happened, but he's still staying quiet. Kurona gets a hold of Kunigami's data, and the difference between him and Isagi is massive, with Kunigami having a total of 89, while Isagi has 76. However, He's clueless as to what he needs to do to increase his scores, so he goes to meet with the man himself, Noah. Isagi goes in and asks Noah what he can do to increase his ranking. Noah asks if Isagi is dissatisfied with the training, but Isagi says that he isn't and that he just wants to win against Kaiser. Noah then asks Isagi what his weapon is and Isagi explains that it's his direct shot. Noah then leads up with a question and asks him what is required for him to use that weapon. Isagi says that he needs to slip past the enemy so that he can move freely in the goal box. It requires a broad view of the state of play and the concentration and fortitude to spend 90 minutes searching for openings in the enemy line and repeatedly challenging them. However, Noah doesn't stop with his follow-up questions and asks what abilities are required for all that to succeed. Isagi stutters, and right off the bat, Noah asks him what's wrong and asks if Isagi can't even verbalize his own ideal. However, Isagi promises that he can and says that what he needs now is the fundamental ability to vary his plays enough that he can respond to any opponent. After that, Noah asks him if hypothetically Isagi had all that and if he would be able to win against Noah. Isagi looks stunned and says that he doesn't know and before he can say anymore, Noah tells him that he needs to revise his thinking and that he was easily able to crack his logic. Noah says that he can't allow any uncertain components in his plan and that he needs to visualize an ideal that he can verbalize and explain fully. And that saying I don't know means that idealistic conjecture is creating noise in his thinking and that's an irrational mental block. Noah then follows that up and says that he would never choose someone like that for his startup. Isagi then once again asks what it is that he's lacking but Noah tells him that he's already told him what it is that he's lacking and asks Isagi what the first thing he does in the morning is saying that the first step is a step towards being the best in the world. Each minute, each second, each day of the year, are you truly spending your time to become the best in the world? Isagi is stunned and his puzzle parts are flying everywhere. He's finally able to understand Noah's philosophy. After that, Noah tells Isagi that Blue Lock is the place that's going to create the best striker in the world and asks Isagi to bring him logic that will defeat even Noah himself. After that, we jump right into the first of many thrilling Neo Egoist League matches. And we're starting it off with a bang, as FC Barcha is facing off against Bastard Munchen. As the FC Barcha players enter the field, Otoya and Bachira spots Isagi on the bench, and Bachira says that he's going ahead. Isagi thinks back to the 10 days of training leading up to this, and says that he wasn't able to reach the top 11 regulars, and out of everyone in Blue Lock, the only one who was chosen was the wildcard himself, Kunigami. 
Isagi is both angry and pissed at every single second he was to spend on the bench. He wants to be on the pitch and burn his presence into the players' minds. And just then, the match starts. Kaiser and Ness begin their honeymoon face as they pass each other. Ness spots Grimm on the other side and passes him a super clean vertical pass right between Barcha's players. Grimm uses his brute force to get behind not one, but two players from Barcha. And then when he gets his chance, he passes the ball to the other side into the legs of Eric Genser. Isagi is stunned as he is looking at their play, saying that Eric is outstanding at trapping and says that he threads the needle with his delicate dribbling, which is such an overexplained way of saying things. Eric looks into the box and decides to pass Kunigami even though he's being surrounded by defenders. The ball is approaching and so is Kaiser. Kaiser is in a perfect position to receive a pass from Kunigami. However, he instead decides to trap the ball with his chest to forcibly keep it. He moves forward while he pushes the defenders back and then shoots an incredible shot with his left leg trademark. The ball is going at an impressive speed, however the Barcher goalkeeper managed to reach it in time and save it. Isagi is still just watching from the sidelines, but he compliments Kunigami, saying that he's evolving at an incredible speed, and that he's drastically boosted all of his physical abilities, which has given him the freedom to be able to score a goal from anywhere on the pitch, calling Kunigami the perfect striker without any weaknesses. The ball is still in play, and Barcha decides to counter, but as Kunigami runs back, Ness stops him. He asks Kunigami what he's trying to do, and that if he had passed to Kaiser, they would have scored. Even so, Kunigami doesn't give a shit and says that he will follow his own way of dominance, telling Ness to go and bark up another tree. This upsets Ness and he grabs Kunigami, telling him with a smile that a violation of loyalty to Kaiser is his first yellow card. After that, we go into something more interesting as Blue Lock's own little monster gets the ball and says that it's showtime. He also says that it's time to raise the BPM before thinking about what football he shall dance. However, before that, we go into a flashback and turn back 10 days to when the Blue Lock players first get introduced to Lavinio. Otoya asks him if this is for real and if Lavinio will teach them football. Lavinio says that he's their master, however he will not teach them football. He laughs and says that this place was built to make the best striker in the world, but he is already the best, so why would he give out any hints? Even so, Bachira asks him if Noel Noah isn't the best striker in the world. This upsets Lavinio, who asks him if he's trying to pick a fight. He then says that he doesn't care what anyone says because he knows that he's the best. Lavinio then goes off and says that he has something inside him. It's something that others can't see, but instead, an image that exists within him alone. He then takes the ball and says that if you want to become the best, then you can't just do as you're told. Back in Brazil, they have a word called ginga, which means something like shaky or swaying. It comes from capoeira, which is a mix between dancing and martial arts. He tells them that you can start out by copying other strong dudes and then try to mix it up and create their own image of the best in the world, saying that their original style starts there. Lavinio himself uses the image of a butterfly as he dances on the field. He ends it by saying that football is all about improvising at the moment. It's about stealing the rhythm to one that pleases you. Then Bachira jumps in and steals the ball, and I love Otoya, he's like Bachira's own hype man. After that, Bachira gets to see how his movements look like. He says that he should try to copy Lavinio's movements and then mix that up with his own image of the world's best. So he begins his training with some hard work and meditation. After that, when Bachira and Lavinio are alone, Bachira tells him that he can also see a thing which he calls his monster. However, Bachira is unsure what to do with it, as he got stronger by overcoming it. But what image should he come up with now? Lavinio asks if the monster is still there, and Bachira says that he can bring it up again if he wants to. Lavinio then says that it's easy and that Bachira has to evolve that monster to the next level. Bachira's monster is his own guide to his originality and will lead to him reaching the spot as the world's best. After that, we get back to the game where Bachira is absolutely crushing an opponent. Igarashi and Hiroi are amazed, but Isagi is focused on something else as he says that he feels that Bachira's dribbling posture has changed. It now feels like he's spending less energy. He's moving the ball around with his foot practically glued to it. Even so, his ball touches do very little movement to his actual center of gravity, which makes him a lot more stable. Another one from Bastard Munchen goes to stop Bachira and says that even though he has infinite options to dribble to, he's still not moving forward. He gets impatient and decides to go in himself, but because of that, he gets absolutely demolished as he was the first one to taste Bachira's new dribble style, his Ginga X monster style. But then another threat comes around as Kunigami comes to stop him. However, Bachira is hyped up as he tells them to go and even calls Kunigami the wild hero. However, before they go at each other, Bachira tells Kunigami that it's nice to see him again, 
but Kunigami just rushes at him, saying that he will take the lead. Bachira tries to shake off Kunigami with some dribbles, but Kunigami is steadily following. Bachira then swings wide with a double touch, which then leads into another double touch. However, this one is much faster than the last one which makes him get behind Kunigami in no time. After Kunigami stands both Grimm and Eric, but they are nothing to Bachira who makes a beautiful back heel pass to Ignacio Lala on the left wing, who right away passes it away to Otoya in the box. The ball falls down and leads on his heel, which he uses to continue the attack and passes it back to Bachira, who's by his side. Bachira jumps up and does an outstanding goal, which gives FC Barcha a one-goal lead. Isagi is watching from the benches and says that FC Barcha really is a free and amusing team that lets the players play as they want. Both Ignacio and Otoya go to celebrate with Bachira, which is kind of sweet. They all look so happy. As Isagi was able to analyze Bachira from the bench, he says that Bachira's dribbling has clearly evolved, saying that Bachira is now able to just do what he wants and says that he attacks like a child, which is also quite sweet. Even so, Bachira also has his adult side where he waits for his opponent and makes a move based on that. Bachira is only able to play like this thanks to FC Barcha's carefree and fun environment. Isagi then compares it with Ego's speech and says that this was what he meant. However, if that's the case, then what is it that he's supposed to learn from his environment? Bastard Munchen's style is rationality, and judging from the other series of plays earlier, they basically cut off every unnecessary move and get in front of the goal by using the shortest possible distance. Isagi thinks about what he would do if he were to get subbed in right now. Should he stick to the role of connecting with Kaiser? No, that's not going to work, as he doesn't possess any individual skills that Grimm and Eric don't have already. But if he were to ignore their rule and play for the sake of his own goal, he might just end up getting ignored like Kunigami is. After that, he overhears Igarashi and Hiroi talking. Igarashi says that Kunigami is going to be substituted any second now, as it's completely a one-man egocentric play. Hiroi agrees and says that it's damaging the team's rationality. Igarashi is really out here thinking that he will get subbed in. Keep wishing, bro. Isagi goes back to his little mind and says that even if he were to get subbed in now, he's no idea what to do. Up until now, he's only been able to fight this far because of Blue Lock's ego mindset and rules. But now it's different, as he has to fit into the bastard munching system. It's already hard getting in with just numbers, but now he has to change his style as well. He looks over at Kunigami and says that his existence is for sure a hint for him to be able to get into the spot of the regulars. And then the match was back. Ness asks Kaiser what they are going to do now, and Kaiser coldly tells him that they will execute them. They start their one-twos with each other and flawlessly get behind three of FC Barcha's players, including Bachira. Isagi is in shock. He says that Ness is really good and that his ankles are really flexible. He then compliments Kaiser for moving up to the perfect position to create a pass course, while Ness stays at the perfect distance to pass at any time. And with his ankle technique, he's able to easily switch directions past an opponent, calling Ness the beating heart of bastard Munchen. Reichi is pissed at the bench and says that if he also had an impressive midfielder behind him, he would be able to score up to a million goals, saying that Kaiser is just blessed by this system. Isagi agrees to an extent and says that the team is moving by doing rational plays. However, ever since this match started, Kaiser's movements haven't had a single second to waste. He's been moving as bait, positioning to receive the ball and breaking out for a shooting course. The way Kaiser moves, it's almost like he's embodying Isagi's ideal movements. They have finally reached the critical point of the field, and just then, all of Bastard Munchen moves up, which gives Ness infinite cross possibilities, which makes it so that the defenders can't even imagine what comes next. And then Ness shoots his cross. The ball goes of course to Kaiser, who's been hiding stealthily in the infinite options within the most efficient spot. However, it's not as easy for Kaiser as it sounds as the man, the myth and the legend Batira comes behind him. Kaiser takes his hand and tries to push him back. Even so, Batira is still holding on. The ball goes down, and Kaiser starts off with a fake out, which disturbs their movements. And then right as he gets his chance, he uses his Kaiser impact to shoot the ball right away. The ball is flying so fast that the goalkeeper has no chance of reacting, and with that, he makes the scores even. Isagi is amazed and calls Kaiser a genius, saying that unlike Bachira, Nagi, or even Rin, on the field, he's a genius of extended plays. Kaiser is able to embody his ideal form, but it's not even that anymore because he's already managed to surpass that. Noah gets up and says that Kaiser's right foot kick that uses all of his body at once to execute, calling Kaiser the fastest in the world when it comes to the swing, which is the one thing he beats Noah in. This makes Isagi wonder if he's been thinking about it all wrong. The foundation of Bastard Munchen's hyper-rationality isn't the players around him, but it's Kaiser's ability itself, 
that is the philosophy of the team. If all the goals are scored with Kaiser impact, an absolute rationality without any inefficiency would be created in the team, the method of turning zero into one. Isagi then thinks back to Ego, saying that it's just as he mentioned before, that an original striker with an overwhelming zero to one is here. But does this mean that Kaiser is the embodiment of Blue Lock's ideals of having the world's best qualities? Kaiser is walking beside Bachira, and he tells him that it was to be expected that the world was filled with nasty egos. Bachira looks back and says that Kaiser is the best, and that's why he will crush him. However, just then, someone rises himself from the seat. He says that he wasn't planning to come out, but even so, he's ready to use his three minutes. And it's of course the man himself, Lavinio, who gets out and goes to join the battle. This shocks everyone who wasn't ready for Lavinio to come out. However, someone quickly goes to the counter, and it's Noah who says that Lavinio is still as immature as always, as he takes off his jacket and goes to join in as well. They go forward to each other and face off, which actually looks so incredibly cool, with both Noah and Lavinio facing off, and not to mention Kitsunezato and Hayate being two hype men as they always are. Noah looks furiously into Lavinio's eyes and says that he lost to Noah last year, but Lavinio just calls Noah's football boring and too rational, saying that his heart goes out to his apprentices. Even so, Noah just tells him that his team is filled with children without a proper adult, which funny enough makes Lavinio turn into a child. After that, Noah turns to Kunigami and asks to hear his theory, saying that to fight on this team, one of the options in the attacks is centralized with Kaiser. And if you don't want to do that, then you will have to show that your abilities surpass Kaiser. However, Kunigami managed to fail in both of them, and on top of that he's got nothing to say in his defense. Noah then turns to the players and says that the opposite of chance is a pinch, and if you miss the chance that's in front of you, you will then fall into a pinch, which is equal to a missed opportunity. But that's only because the risk and return are equal. He goes back to Kunigami and tells him that he's failed and is being put on the bench for a better player who is none other than Isagi Yoichi. This makes Four Eyes angry and he goes to argue right away. He asks Noah to give him an explanation and that when it comes to training numbers, he is better. Even so, the world has to get what they want and that is Isagi. Isagi's chance has finally come and he will now make his debut match and dive into the field of superstars. And with that, the two teams get ready and then quickly start the game. Lavinio has the ball and Noah goes to stop him right off the bat. Lavinio tries to throw him off but it's the best player in the world we are talking about here. Isagi is looking from the side and says that there is no way for him to keep up, calling it a battle of the gods. Even so, it's not like he just wants to give up and let them have their fun, because he finds a space that he thinks he can use to help Noah. However, as he gets closer, Lavinio does a rainbow flick and then uses Isagi as a block to get past Noah. Igarashi is screaming from the bench, but it's not like he could have done any better. Noah quickly asks Isagi if he knows why Lavinio is called the dance man, however Isagi has no idea, so Noah explains that he's the best in the world at taking his opponents by surprise. However, those magnificent steps are not the origin of that name, as the players who are led by his dribbles seem like they're dancing as they topple down. While Noah is giving his explanation, we can see Lavinio absolutely destroying the bastard Munchen's defense. He gets to the goalkeeper and jumps over him to then get to the finishing line and backheel the ball into the goal, making FC Barcha take the lead in this game and also telling everyone to dance till they die and then calls them cripples randomly, just standard Lavigno. With Lavigno calling everyone cripples, he got Bachira to fanboy over him to then call him a god. We then get this wholesome panel of FC Barcha celebrating together. After that, Kaiser goes over to Isagi and says that he really screwed up there this makes Isagi mad and says he couldn't get in either. However, Kaiser tells him that he's wrong and that he chose not to, saying that he and Bachira were waiting for a chance where either of them seemed off rhythm. Any other timing and they would just be a nuisance dragging the two down. He asks Isagi how he could be so lowly to not understand such a thing, calling him an overly self-conscious clown. Kaiser walks away and Isagi stays behind thinking that he can't get into the game. However, he can't just give up and tell himself that there's a gap in ability between him and the masters, and to leave a trace of his existence, he will have to score his own goal and says that he will devour the superstars. And just like that, the game is back in action. Ness and Kaiser start off passing to each other, while Isagi thinks that the only way to steal a goal in this team would be to find a better position than Noah, and then patiently wait for a pass there. But just then, Noah starts to speed up and accelerates behind a bunch of FC Barta players. Ness sees him speeding up and passes him. He gets the ball and embarrasses another FC Barcha player. 
As Isagi is trying his best to keep up with Noah's play, he finally realizes that it's impossible for the current him to find a better position than Noah. Noah keeps on destroying until Lavinio goes to stop him. However, Noah gets over him surprisingly easily. Even so, he gets stopped by the other players, which gives Lavinio time to get up again, to then bash into Noah's strong body. However, Noah uses this to his advantage and gets on top of Lavinio, to then use his ability of being ambidextrous to shoot a power shot with his left leg. The ball has incredible speed as it goes into the goal and makes the scores even and making the last goal more important than ever before. Isagi thinks back to Noah's outstanding goal and says that a person completely ambidextrous is really rare to see and happens to less than 1% of humans. But with Noah's insane performance comes also a tragedy as the three minutes have passed and both of the masters have to go out. As Noah is going back to his seat, he looks at Kunigami and says that it's time for him again. He asks if Kunigami thinks that he can trace Noah's movements after seeing it live, also calling him the wild card's copy man. As Noah is getting to his seat, he tells both Isagi and Kunigami that this is the last chance for both of them and says that if they disappoint, then they can get replaced at any time, telling them to prove themselves with numbers. And then, the rivalry of the last goal starts between Kunigami and Isagi. As they are walking onto the pitch, Isagi asks Kunigami what Noah meant when he called him a copy man. Kunigami asks why it would matter to Isagi, but he tells him that he want to know what happened at the wild card so that he can beat him. Kunigami explains that the wild card was an experiment to create a vessel and someone with the same physique as Noah. A physique that would be the same as the best player in the world. Isagi is shocked and asks how it worked. However, Kunigami says that it doesn't matter and tells him that it's not like anyone on this team is going to pass to him, telling Isagi that he should worry about himself more. And then the final stretch starts as FC Barcha starts with the ball. Isagi goes to block Bachira, but gets hit with his incredibly fast stepovers. But before he can do anything, Bachira passes to Atoya and then manages to get behind Isagi. However, behind Isagi comes Grimm, who's fast on the attack and gets help from Kunigami. But not even the two of them can stop Bachira when he's starting his dance. But someone who can is Ness, who's been hiding in the dark and has waited for the right moment to strike. He gets the ball and begins the counter-attack of Bastard Munchen. Isagi knows that Ness will try to pass to Kaiser, so as the ball is getting closer to Kaiser, he gets in the way and hijacks the pass. However, he's in a very bad position to score from and only has a total of 2% goal percentage. He tries to think about what to do, but the FC Barcher players are pushing him fast and he has no way to react, so he ends up taking the shot anyway, which sadly gets blocked. Even though he managed to get the ball, he was left with no ideas from that point on. And to begin with, that pass from Ness was perfected for the purpose of letting Kaiser score. So even if he were to get the ball again, without Kaiser's weapon, it's useless, as this isn't a range that you can score from without Kaiser's impact. The ball finally lands in the hands of Grimm, and Isagi tries to get him to play together, but he quickly gets ignored. He knows that now more than ever, he needs to find a new way to score because if he fails, then this match ends and if the match were to end, then he's failed at proving the worth of his existence. The only way he could turn this around is if he listened to Ego and tries his best to get into flow state and then find a way to score the finishing goal. Grimm is quickly advancing through the left side. He looks into the box and sees Kunigami trying his best to block of Kaiser. This makes it impossible for Grimm to pass Kaiser, so he turns to his other option, which is Ness. However, before the ball actually reaches Ness, our main man Isagi comes and steals it again making it 2-0 for Isagi versus Ness. Even so, Isagi is facing trouble right off the bat as Bachira goes to cover him, saying that stealing the ball from his teammate is so like him, which is quite funny in a way. However, both Bachira and Isagi know that he has no way of scoring from that angle. As Isagi does a fake shot to get Bachira off balance, he says that he can't see his own goal, but this is his only option to devour Kaiser, even if it means abandoning his own goal. It looks like Isagi is trying to pass Kaiser, and Ness suddenly looks happy saying that he's finally aiming to assist Kaiser, and Kaiser adds on calling him a good boy, and let me just say that I wish I was Isagi so much right now, for absolutely no reason of course. Isagi passes the ball into the middle, but as he passes, he tells Kaiser to go fuck himself, and that he would never pass someone like him, because he was instead aiming for the person behind Kaiser, and that person was none other than the edgelord Kunigami. As Kunigami is powering up his shot, he tells Kunigami that the two of them can destroy not just Kaiser, but the whole team. After that, Kunigami understands that if he doesn't shoot soon, then the ball will hit his balls, so he takes his outstanding left shot to shoot an incredible goal, which from the looks of it, even shocks Noah. 
And with Isagi's and Kunigami's teamwork, it leads to a goal, but not just one goal, but also the honor of winning the whole match. And to end it off, Isagi tells Kunigami that this team is there to take. Kunigami goes forward to Isagi and asks him why he decided to pass him, telling him that there's no reason for him to owe Isagi such a favor. Even so, Isagi says that he just wanted an outcome that he could grasp. He tells Kunigami that he didn't do it for him, but instead to benefit him. Kunigami looks disappointed and says that Isagi's only solution was through an assist. As he walks away, he calls Isagi a fallen striker. After that, Bachira goes forward to Isagi and says that he won't criticize the goal if that was what he intended for, but still hints that he was a bit disappointed at Isagi's decision. But even so, he is curious as to why Isagi passed to Kunigami instead of Kaiser, who was in a much better position. Isagi tells him that he wouldn't want to be Kaiser's pet, and that Kunigami's lefty shot was the only element he knew of. Bachira is still a bit disappointed, but he tells Isagi that the next time the two of them meet, it will be as egoists aiming for the same goal. Isagi agrees, and asks for Bakira to wait for him, saying that he will soon be on the same stage as him as a striker. But as they are talking, they can hear someone laughing, and it's none other than Ness. He laughs about the thought of Isagi as a striker, and says that Isagi didn't only steal the assisting role from him, but he even ignored Kaiser and passes the ball to Kunigami, who were at a disadvantage. Isagi just tells Ness to shut up, and says that at the end of the day, they won with Kunigami's goal, and that numbers don't lie. He asks Ness if that isn't the team philosophy. However, Ness is persistent and says that the team just happens to be Kaiser's, and I just love Bachira's little confused face as he's unsure if he should break up the fight or what he's supposed to do. Isagi then coldly tells Ness that the team will soon be his. Before they can start to actually fight, Kaiser comes in between and completely shoves Ness face down. He apologizes and says that he underestimated Isagi. Kaiser says that after the last play, it's time for a revision in their casting, and says that Kunigami is the leader of their blue lock squad while Isagi is the pawn under him. I actually feel sorry for Bachira, who just randomly got dragged into this conversation and has to listen to them. Anyway, Isagi then gives Kaiser his own role, how kind of him. Isagi gives Kaiser the role of the naked king who had everything stolen from him, which definitely deserves a place in Isagi's top 10 coldest moments. But just then, they get interrupted by Ego, who compliments them on their first game. He then randomly starts talking about how good his drink is before starting to compare the world of pros to a game of musical chairs, saying that when you get into a team that's already complete, you have to then steal somebody's position, or else you will end up with no job, and every team has its own philosophy with everything from logic, freedom, rules, and that sort. After he's talked some more, he goes into the new rankings now that the match is over. We can see all of the numbers just starting to add up more and more. Rachi asks what the numbers mean, and Ego says that they're yearly salaries for the players, revealing the true purpose of the Neo-Egoist League telling them that all of the matches are under the inspection of football club owners in the whole world. All of them will watch the game and then bid on each player after each match and the highest bid will represent their value. Isagi's salary finally comes to a stop and it's at 17 million yen, which completely shocks him. Ego also explains that these aren't just some made-up numbers as they are all actual contract offers that will be given after each match is finished. Each bid gives the club the right for negotiating a contract for that annual salary and it also serves another purpose, as it's their current value. Isagi's club offer came from Dortmund, which is Bastard Munchen's biggest rival, kind of ironic. We also get to see other players' offerings, like Kunigami, who got a 24 million yen offering from Kawasaki Breakers. Bachira had one himself, which came from FC Portimian, and had a salary of 32 million yen. The Rat also got one from his own club, which is kind of weird, but then we see the real price, who is Kaiser's offering, which also comes from Bastard Munchen, and contains a total of 300 million yen. After that, Igarashi and Raichi quickly realize how useless they are as their offerings are zero. Ego explains that it's because they haven't played any matches yet and tells them at the end of the Neo-Egoist League, excluding the overseas players of course. But they will use the salary ranking from Blue Lock to determine the top 23 players in Blue Lock who will automatically join the team in the U20 World Cup, which is quite sick. Ego tells the Blue Lock players that this is an opportunity to hone their skills and for the foreigners, this is a place to showcase themselves to club owners all over the world, making this a marketplace for new talents. Rechi looks upset and asks if that means that they are simply products to him, and Ego says that he would be fully right. However, it doesn't end there as Ego says that he made a deal that he would showcase the popular players and especially Isagi. Even so, Noah was against it until the bitter end. In the end, he only accepted to be forced to use him for a single match, 
to then get a price tag on the poster boy. But Chira quickly grasps the situation and says that in the end, it doesn't matter if the team wins or loses as long as they can show off their value. And Bachira is correct, but for a striker to show off their value, they have to score goals, so in the end, they will have to try their hardest to win. Igarashi adds on by saying that this is a big chance for most of the players, but on the flip side, if you fail to get a spotlight here, you will leave an impression on all big teams that you're just some loser. And Igo simply ignores it and says that he loves that they show off their angry faces, telling them that it sells like hotcakes. He asks them if they don't think that it's weird that he managed to get world superstars and top clubs to take part in a project like this. But he then reveals that he's sending a reality show of them. He then shows them a live video from the second match, which is currently going on, which is the Ubers versus PXG. He shows Rin fighting his all on the pitch before saying that the number of people who subscribe to this content has already surpassed 80 million. Revealing that it's his own super entertainment Blue Lock TV. So all of them Blue Lock players are currently fighting for their lives while it's being streamed to the whole world. We get back to the match where Rin has gone into his shooting stance and makes a wonderful goal, giving PXG the win. Ego tells the Blue Lock players that there is no doubt left that Blue Lock is the most critical place in the current world of football. Isagi is thinking to himself how amazing this is and calls Ego a genius. But it doesn't end there as Ego reveals the sad truth that if you can't get into matches, you won't get to show off and will end up with no offerings. They may continue to aim for the striker position as they have, or they can try escaping to another position to steal the place of another regular. No matter what they do, they have to prove their worth. And then he ends it by telling them that their next match is in 10 days against England's Manchine City. And with that, we jump right into a flashback to 10 days earlier, when the Blue Lock players first meet Chris Prince. Chris explains that the philosophy of his team is speed and rush, which only a healthy body can harbor. Now that's a very good message and all, but it would help if he actually said it to the Blue Lock players and not to the camera. Anyway, Chris goes up to Chigiri and asks him what exactly he was hoping for when he chose Manshine City. Chigiri doesn't really have a straight answer, but says that he wants his speed to be more powerful. After that, Chris takes the matter into his own hands as he starts analyzing Chigiri's body, and I mean his whole body. But it's not just Chigiri who gets the special service as both Ryo and Nagi also get a taste of it. After Chris is done with his assignment, he says that he understands their talents and that he's able to see how they've managed to get this far. Even so, he tells them that they all rely too much on their talents, and when they don't take care of their talents, it will end up withering. He takes the talent to run fast as an example, and says that it's not something that was taught by someone else, and that they simply acquired that talent naturally thanks to their body's disposition. However, in order to become a better player, that person desired the power to be like a tank. Their own body was previously developed only to be able to run fast, and then the training was like putting on a suit of armor to a body like that. What ended up happening was that they got slower. They managed to lose their balance thanks to the excessive muscles, and became a worse player. If someone lusts for power while not understanding the mechanism of their own talent, they might start training blindly and end up with a body completely unbalanced which makes your talent useless. Thanks to that, you would end up losing your identity, breaking your mentality, and being completely done as a player which is quite common in the world. It happens all the time that geniuses vanish completely, and being successful while still not understanding your own mechanism can easily turn into a curse that brings you suffering. Chris reveals that he was just like that in the past. It's extremely important for you to understand what kind of muscles helps you bring out your talent and create plays that you want, but when you figure out how to do it, your body will look as jacked as Chris's does. After Chris's emotional speech, which lasted an eternity, he goes full ad mode and says that that's the reason why water is better than cola and promotes his Prince water. After that quick ad breaks provided by Chris, he reveals what the players will get in joining Manchin City. They will understand all of the mechanisms of their bodies and start to feel their own talents in their body, and only with a perfect body will you be able to use your talents properly. And the reason they are all here is to awaken the unknown talent that still sleeps within them. And that's how the Blue Lock player's crazy journey started. After that, we get back into real time where Manchin City is reacting to the game between Bastard Munchen and FC Barcha. Nagi is shocked at Isagi's 17 million salaries, and one thing which I think is on all of their minds is the possibility of them debuting in the U20 team, which still blows my mind. However, it's quite hard seeing the whole picture as Chris is like a walking ad everywhere in Manshine City. But after that comes the salaries for the PXG and Ubers match, where we see Aryu, or the style guy as Nagi calls him. Anyway, he got a 5 million offer from Urawa Rubies. 
After that, we have Karasu who had to play as a middlefield which is quite unusual for him I would assume. Anyway, he got a 12 million offer from the real PXG which is quite sick. After him it's Aiku who got a 15 million offer from Bolos, Shidu also managed to get away with a 20 million offer from Ajax, and Rin with the astonishing 36 million offer from PXG as well. And then we can see the whole ranking, and just look at how many people are without any value yet. I'm sure that the rankings will shift a lot, but there will be a bunch of players without any in the end, unfortunately. Chris then tells them that he knew about everything the whole time, but Ego made him keep quiet. However, he says that now that everything has been revealed, they can truly get started as their next opponents are Bastard Munchen. And then we get two panels where we can see all of them putting in their maximum work effort. And Nagi also tells the world to wait for him, which sounds so incredibly cool. After that, we leave Manshin City and head back to Bastard Munchen, where they have just gotten back to their changing room. Isagi is sitting on the bench, thinking about Kunigami's goal, and says that he wants it to be his goal next time. Even so, it doesn't take long for his peace and quiet to last, as both Igarashi and Reichi start pimping up against each other. Igarashi walks over to Isagi and says that his new salary is amazing, but even though he's gotten a huge offer, it's more about the club he says, as he's been a big Dortmund fan. Then Isagi takes a moment to think back, as he says that their efforts in Blue Lock have directly reached the world, saying that all of them are incredible. However, the one who's the most incredible of them all is Rin who's even got a higher value than Isagi. In the end, it comes down to who's scored the most goals, and on top of that, he knows that he can't be a forward in Japan's U20 team the way he is now. After that, Gagamaru gives everyone a reality check real quick and says that there are only three more games and if you can't play a match, then you're done for. Corona agrees and adds that they might even have to resort to taking other positions than they aim for. Even so, Raichi says that he refuses and is persistent on being a striker. Then he tries to feel pity for himself and says that if he only were a favorite of theirs as Isagi is, However, Isagi quickly tells him that it's not like he asked for it. The other players say that they think it's great that Isagi got his opportunity, or well, everyone except one, and that's Yukimiya, who says that he will never accept it. He asks Isagi how he can even think about being in the regulars if he's out on the pitch assisting. Isagi tells him that it wasn't like he wanted to, but Yukimiya adds oil to the fire and says that even if that's true, he's still disappointed in Isagi. Even Hiroi and Gagamaru acknowledge that this isn't like Yukimiya to say, However, Isagi still responds to him, telling Yukimiya that sure he did an assist, but that play was only a waypoint to becoming a striker. He even asks Yukimiya if he wouldn't have done the same thing, however Yukimiya denies that, and says that he wouldn't, and that passing doesn't feel good. Isagi tells him that this isn't about feeling good, it's the result of focusing on what he could challenge in his own way. He tells Yukimiya that he has no regrets about making that choice. Yukimiya then says that if that were the case, Isagi could have just lost by himself without getting an assist and this makes Isagi mad as he gets right up and asks if Yukimiya is trying to pick a fight with him. Yukimiya tries to defend himself and says that he was just saying what he thought but Isagi tells him to speak only after he's realized his own ideals and says that if he can be in the regulars with just lip service then even an idiot like Igarashi can. Isagi calls Yukimiya blind to reality. Now Isagi has lit Yukimiya's fire as well as he gets angry and tells Isagi to not expect that his righteousness to be accepted by everyone, telling Isagi that as long as his ideals are far out of sight, he will fight until he dies. This makes Isagi furious who's about to probably place Yukimiya in his place with a beating. But before he can do so, Hiroi comes in between and stops him. And then in the midst of it all comes Kaiser who tells Yukimiya to join him if he hates Isagi that much. Kaiser says that they're all afraid to face the reality of their own weaknesses, so they shift the issue by finding fault in others who have succeeded, however eventually they run away from their ideals, telling Yukimiya that he can help him tame the jealous demon inside him. Even so, Yukimiya isn't so interested in joining Kaiser either as he turns him down. However, before he leaves, he tells them to make a good choice and to not end up serving the wrong king. As Kaiser has left, Hiroi says that he's so full of himself and says that they are all still by Isagi's side. However, the room is silent after he said it. He asks everyone what's wrong, and they all say that they have to think about themselves, and that they either link with Isagi or become a part of Kaiser's system. Realizing that they have their own way of fighting, and Corona even says that either one of them can turn to a friend or foe. After that, we jump right into a flashback, starting with Yukimiya just going about his day shopping when he was approached by a photographer who asks him if he wants to model. However, Yukimiya tells him that it causes trouble as there's an all-Japan soccer championship next month. Yukimiya continues fighting on the soccer path 
and is determined to become a pro soccer player. However, when he's suddenly out with his friends, his vision starts to get blurry and weird, so he goes to the doctor, who says that it's tunnel vision, an appearance of blind spots when he's fatigued, which is common causes of optic neuropathy. The progression of this eye disease can't be stopped. It's accompanied by headache and nausea, and in the worst case scenario, it could lead to blindness. Even so, with the proper treatment, the progression can be slowed down, so Yukimiya shouldn't be generally concerned, as he can still model and go about his daily life without any problems. However, it comes down crashing when he asks about soccer. The doctor tells him that as long as it's a hobby, it won't be a problem to continue playing, but he finds it difficult to see Yukimiya being able to take the path of becoming a pro. Yukimiya asks the doctor why it was he that had to face this, and if he did anything wrong, he just wanted to become the best player in the world. His words start to shake as he starts to cry, asking for his dream to come back. The doctor feels sorry for him and says that he understands his pain, and that he will from now on support him the best he can on Yukimiya's road to becoming a pro. Yukimiya knows that his time is running out, however. Before he completely loses his sight, he will become the best striker in the world. After that, we go back into real time, where we see Yukimiya training extremely hard, and because of that, his vision starts to get blurry due to his tiredness. Yukimiya thinks back to Isagi's words and says that he's really annoyed with him, and surely it could be jealousy, as he hasn't done anything since entering the Neo Egoist League, and yet, Isagi keeps getting what he wants. He knows that even though it's frustrating he has to recognize his own weaknesses, it doesn't matter how much passion he puts into it, or how much hard work, as he has to prove his existence in his own way, even if it means dying with his ideals. After that, we get to Isagi also doing some extremely hard training. He as Yukimiya also thinks back to their argument before. He admits that what Yukimiya said is true, however it's more than just that, as the real problem is that he couldn't do anything in that game as a striker. He's shown results for the team with his assist, but to be able to score the next time he has to find out what it is that he's lacking. After he played with Noah, he was able to fully realize that he couldn't see himself beating him right now, and that he admired him too much to be a target. He has to find a target before taking on Noah and says that the one who would fill that place is none other than Kaiser. Isagi will now do his best to study Kaiser, make him his weapon, and he will show him who survives in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. After that, we fast forward to 10 days when it is time for Bastard Munchen and Noah to announce the regulars for the next match. Noah says that he has based the result of their training and match appearance. Every player was then selected for bringing the desired numbers, and without further ado, he reveals the starting squad. The start with the obvious one, which is, of course, Kaiser in the center forward. After Kaiser comes to Kunigami, who's been placed on the same position, but on the right side. And then finally he gets to the offensive midfielder position, which luckily Isagi has managed to snatch away, taking Gesner's spot in the team, while Grimm takes the other side. On the top center, we have Ness followed by Ali, who will play as a defensive midfielder. Then for the right side back, he puts in Kurona, which makes me so happy to finally see him play. Noah says that both Kunigami and Isagi are on the right side, which gives Corona the chance to link up with them. After that, Corona looks at Isagi and says that as long as he's in the match, he will take Isagi's side. For the two centers back, we have Menzer and Birkenstock. To follow them up, we get to the left side back, which Yukimiya is given, which will definitely make an interesting match between him and Isagi. After that, Noah gets to the final position, which is the goalkeeper, however, he doesn't want to use their goalkeeper, because he chose the man himself, Gagamaru, to get a special position. Noah says that it might not be the position that he had hoped for, but Gagamaru is just happy to be playing. After that, Noah says that this team was formed using only their numbers, but it also serves as an experimental team of 11. Because as they know the team has two different philosophies, the first one is the efficient football that Kaiser uses, and the other one is the blue lock style, which consists of using chemical reactions among themselves. Noah is interested in seeing how a team that is simply focused on Kaiser scoring goals will mix with Blue Lock's philosophy. Kaiser quickly gets it and asks Noah if this is a test for him, and Noah tells him that he's right and warns him not to fail. After that, the match between Bastard Munchen and Manshine City finally starts. As the players walk into the field, Isagi goes up to Nagi and Ryo, congratulating them on making the main team, which sounds a bit cocky. Ryo goes off and walks up to Kunigami, saying that he sure went through a lot, saying that both of them lost to Shidu in the second selection, and that it could have been either one of them. As he's walking away, he tells Kunigami that he's happy that he's back. When Ryo has left, another familiar face comes around the corner, and it's of course our favorite princess, Chigiri. 
Chigiri doesn't hold back and says that he knows that Kunigami thinks that he's changed to a total edgelord. However, to Chigiri, he's still fighting the same old Kunigami who he knows. As they leave, Chigiri says that he will be the one to wake Kunigami up. And with that, the third match of the Neo Egoist League starts. Kaiser starts off by passing the ball to Ness. Isagi is following both Ness's and Kaiser's movements clearly and says that in the 10 days leading to this match, he's been able to run simulations on how to fight. His first condition is Kunigami. However, he will not play alongside Isagi and will most likely try to score on his own. And then there's Kaiser, who's just straight up a disturbance on the field. Even so, Isagi knows that Kaiser is the center of this team and even calls him a superior version of himself. Ness and Kaiser are continuing their pass game and even letting Grimm join in on the fun, how kind of them. As Isagi is analyzing Kaiser, he knows that he has to understand him and then use him to evolve and then he gets his opportunity. As Grimm passes Kaiser, Isagi goes in between and steals the pass. However, what he didn't anticipate was that Ryo would see right through him as he saw Isagi coming from a mile away. When Isagi goes back in and tries to win the ball back, he immediately gets pushed back by Ryo's new improved physical body. Ryo then manages to slip behind him, only to face off against another player from Bastard Munchen. However, this time, it's Ness who's come to stop him. Ness manages to stop him for a while, but it's all over when Ryo takes out Sei's insane nutmeg from the U20 match. After that, Ryo continues on his rampage as he gets behind more and more players, saying that he's in his chameleon-style striker mode, which just sounds so cool. While Isagi is helplessly running to try and stop Ryo, he says that Ryo has managed to improve all of his parameters and that the Ryo from before would just focus on passing to Nagi, but now he's using Nagi as a dummy to head for the goal himself. As Ryo is getting closer to the goal, he says that he won't rely on Nagi and that he will surpass him and become the best striker in the world as he shoots a wonder ball to the goal. However, Ryo's shot was merely a copy of Rin's goal, which Gagamaru has already been able to analyze, so he just barely manages to stop the ball from going into the goal, saying that Ryo is still just a copy after all. Bastard Munchen clears the ball and the ball is headed to Kaiser, however Chigiri swipes in between and steals it. After that, we get right into a flashback to 20 days earlier. Chris Prince is talking to the Blue Lock players about a body revolution, which basically means increasing the potential of their own strengths in their body. Even so, you can't just train blindly, as every player uses their muscles differently, which is why Chris has created individual training routines for every player. He starts off with Ryo and asks him what type of player he wants to be. Ryo says that he needs to think, but Chris tells him that this isn't something that you should think hard on, asking Ryo how the world's best striker would respond to that question. Ryo then says that he wants to be able to control the field by himself and become a striker who can steal goals. Ryo doesn't want to be a player who's in need of other players anymore. He straight up says that he now wants to have the power to be the best striker in the world. Chris then explains that no matter how talented someone is, it's not like they can stay positive every day. They might feel a sense of negativity and have moments when they lose confidence. And by always being destined for more, he's become unable to forgive himself when he doesn't match his ideal. Chris says that there have been people that have described him as a narcissist and people who think that he's crazy. Even so, he can't just betray the ideal that he set for himself. Telling the blue lock players to pursue their ideals and fight against reality, and if they want to become the best striker in the world, then they need a body that can host their ideals. After Chris's pep talk, he goes back to Ryo and asks him if he's able to specifically say what kind of player he sees as his ideal. Ryo smiles and says that Chris is right and that he's forgotten how to live like that. And for Ryo, the best player in the world that he can imagine would be a fusion of Itoshi Rin and Itoshi Sei. After that, Chris gets a feel of Ryo's body, I mean literally. After that, we get back into the game and Chigiri is still in possession of the ball. He has a fierce look in his eyes as he runs towards Bastard Munchen's defense. As he's running, he says that his ideal would be to not pass the ball, as he wants to use his legs to go past all the defenders and then score goals as a striker. And that's basically what he's doing on the field now, as he's gotten behind both Ali and Corona and is now faced with Isagi. Isagi tells him that he won't let Chigiri pass, however Chigiri coldly tells Isagi that he's the perfect guinea pig. Chigiri then rushes toward Isagi and gives us this outstanding panel, which looks so dope. Anyway, the fierce duel between Chigiri and Isagi starts. Isagi knows that Chigiri's dominant leg is his right, and that Chigiri is only able to shoot high precision kicks with it. And therefore Isagi thinks that it's strange that Chigiri was assigned to the left side where he's forced to use his left leg. But then he understands that Chigiri's goal isn't to fully use the left side, but instead cut into the middle. Chigiri goes for a cut inside, 
and when Isagi goes to cover it, he realizes that he's been fooled and that Chigiri was aiming to do a double feint. However, ahead of Chigiri lies another player from Bastard Munchen. Then we get a quick flashback to Chris Prince and Chigiri talking. Chris tells Chigiri that to connect his speed to the goal, he should try to create a golden zone. It is said that the famous star player Del Piero had one as well. He had a zone where he could mass produce goals from. Chigiri quickly connects a golden zone to Baru and Zantetsu and says that they probably had one as well. And after that, we get back into the game and learn that Chigiri's golden zone is 19 meters from the goal and then 44 degrees to the left. Chigiri stops the ball before he goes all into a cut in which Isagi and Mesner are unable to react to. Just as Chigiri is 4 meters away from his golden zone, Kunigami comes in his way. However, even the muscle head is nothing to Chigiri who gets behind him in an instant and then gets into his golden zone. He aims at the top corner of the goal and the shot from Chigiri is so outstanding that Gagamaru has no way of saving it, which means that Chigiri scores and gives Manchin City a one goal lead. After that, we can see how Chigiri's mom and sister are eagerly watching and game and get super excited as Chigiri scores which is quite wholesome. However, it's not only them that are mind blown by Chigiri's goal as Isagi is looking at Chigiri amazed. He says that all of Chigiri's qualities have bumped up by a huge margin. He is now able to use his own speed as bait and then manages to slash throw players with his lightning quick cut in. Not to mention Chigiri's amazing goal that he managed to make. Isagi tells Chigiri that he's changed, but then Chigiri tells him that it's the golden formula. They manage to break down the equation that has worked so far, and after that, they picked out which factor stood out and then reconstructed the most ideal combination for him. If that wasn't enough, he also had to train endlessly to create a specialized body that helped him to evolve. Chigiri says that in this neo-egoist league, he's going to be a striker who is able to rise to the top of the blue lock. He looks behind and says to both Isagi and Kunigami to not be too slow or they will be left behind, which is just so cool. After that, Kaiser comes and says that Chigiri is good, fast, strong, and above all beautiful, which I definitely can't argue with. Kaiser gets closer to Isagi, and this time I mean closer like bro was legit breathing in his ear. After that, they go to start the game again, and Kaiser asks Isagi if he has a plan, or if he's already stuck, kind of mocking him, but that's what Kaiser usually does. And after that, to everyone's surprise, Kaiser passes Isagi telling him that he can do whatever he wants with it, with the ball. Isagi is looking more fearful than ever, as he says that he will make Kaiser regret that pass. Right off the bat, Ryo goes to guard Isagi, telling him that he's already splitting up with his teammates. However, this time Isagi has someone to fight with, and it's of course our favorite shark boy, who tells Isagi that he's decided that he will ally himself with Isagi. Corona gets behind Ryo, and Isagi says that Corona is a perfect teammate for him, as he allows Isagi to look ahead and see the entire field. By Corona's ability to instantly sense a position that is both unfavorable to the enemy and advantageous to him, comparing Corona to an orbit which is always following him around. And then we get this incredible panel which looks so stunning with multiple Coronas which are surrounding Isagi, and it also creates Isagi's and Corona's planet hotline attack. As Corona and Isagi are steadily moving up on the field, Isagi says that their key to breaking through the right side is Kunigami, due to his goal in the previous game. The opposing team is wary of the passes directed to him and needs at least one or more players to guard him. Isagi wants to move up to the space where Kunigami wants to move and then catch it from behind. So Isagi passes back the ball to Corona to then receive it at the perfect position to finish it in front of the goal except he forgot one little small detail and that's Kaiser who comes in his way and steals the ball asking Isagi if this is all he's got. However, the chain follows as Chigiri now comes in Kaiser's way and shoots away the ball. This just makes Kaiser more excited and I just need to tell him to back off because Chigiri is mine, nothing more to it. Anyway, the ball goes to Ryo and he traps it marvelously and with that, both Agi and Nagi start to move up on the field. The ball is headed to Nagi and two players from Bastard Munchen tries to sandwich him. However, Nagi is able to shove them away with his core power, which definitely surprised me. Then he does some kind of backward roulette into some dribbling moves, which gets him away from the Bastard Munchen players. Nagi's play shocks Isagi as he says that this isn't the Nagi he used to know and that Nagi never used to create plays on his own. However, we once again get interrupted when it is as exciting as we get a flashback to 20 days earlier, where Chris asks Nagi what kind of football the ideal Nagi desires. Nagi just straight up tells him that he wants to beat Isagi, saying that they are rivals. Chris tries to get into more details and asks Nagi how he plans on defeating Isagi, but Nagi has no idea saying that he hasn't really thought that it. After that, Chris asks Nagi what he thinks about when he's about to score a goal. 
However, as we know Nagi doesn't really think that much, like at all. So they go to gather data instead. Chris says that Nagi's results are quite intriguing and that what's necessary for his greatest strength is to relax his body instantaneously so that Nagi can use his whole body to trap the ball. Chris even says that when it comes to relaxing his body, he's better than Chris. However, it isn't only praise that Nagi is getting, as Chris tells him that when it comes to creativeness, he's basically pointless, saying that Nagi depends on others too much and that his playstyle is determined by the level of his partners. To fix that, Chris suggests that Nagi should try to play an active playstyle, something that starts from Nagi's trapping abilities. However, all of this talking fries Nagi's brain, so Agi comes in to help. Agi suggests that Nagi should learn a trap that brings things back to zero, which works well in any situation, and can basically just reset the game. After that, we finally get back into the game. As Nagi is thinking about what to do, he wonders if Isagi and Ryo think this much all the time, calling it tiring. Nagi sees Agi up in the box and passes him. Agi makes a massive jump into the sky and is in the perfect position to score, but that's when he instead passes the ball down to Nagi again. Nagi legit traps the ball with his foot to then juggle to the ball and get it up in the air, and then just shoots an awesome shot to the goal. However, Yukimiya comes in Nagi's way and covers the goal with his face, no wonder that he has trouble seeing. Anyway, Yukimiya's save was a life-saving save for Bastard Munchen, because I don't know if they would be able to recover from two goals. Even so, Manshine City still walked away with a corner kick. After that, Agi goes up to Nagi to give him his diagnosis. He gives Nagi's attack an 8 out of 100, which is a really surprising score. However, Agi tells Nagi that it was because his pass was too rough, and that if it were anyone else, they wouldn't have been able to reach it. Even so, Agi compliments Nagi's finishing idea and calls it interesting. While they are talking, Isagi is watching from afar. He's stunned to see the two of them testing stuff out in the middle of such an important match and even more surprised that Agi is able to teach Nagi football. Then it snaps for Isagi as he thinks back, saying that Nagi has only moved according to his or Ryo's commands and that he's a newbie when it comes to football. Because of this, Nagi is sitting on a pile of infinite potential. Just then, Ryo comes by. He says that it was first him, then Isagi, that influenced him with football and now it's Agi and Chris. And if their guidance proves to be successful, he may reach more and more levels, and then it will be the birth of the actual greatest genius in the world. As Ryo is walking away, he tells Isagi to not get left behind, and says that Nagi is the type of guy who can discard anything to chase what he wants. And then it was time for the corner kick. Isagi thinks that Chigiri will probably try to shoot a precise curve into the box, and said that Chigiri's most likely target will be Agi because of his height. Chigiri shoots it, but it isn't a precise curve as Isagi thought, but instead a low trajectory. Isagi tries to get ahead of Agi, but he's no match. Isagi thinks that he can at least limit his shooting course, however Agi isn't there to shot, but instead to do a backheel pass to Nagi, who's been eagerly waiting in the box. He's just about to jump and maybe do the first cycling kick of the series, however that's when Kaiser comes in his way and almost catapults the ball away. As Kaiser falls to the ground, Agi says that it's nice to see him again and that he finally has a chance to analyze him. Kaiser just coldly tells him to make sure to babysit properly and calls him the mad footballer. And I'm really interested in learning more about Kaiser's and Aggie's connection to each other as it seems that they kind of know of each other and has probably played before. After that, we get back to the game where it's starting to look like a race to the ball. And the one of wins the race and the one who should probably change sport to formula is Ness. Ness says that it's the magic hour as he completely destroys a player from Manshine City. As Isagi is following both Ness and Kaiser, he says that even if he tries to steal Ness's pass from Kaiser, he will just end up getting a bad shot out of it. So this time to score a goal, he has to change his train of thought. He decides to follow Kaiser from behind and study his thought patterns from his viewpoints. He analyzes as Kaiser and Ness exchange passes with each other and says Kaiser will probably try to find a less marked place as they are getting closer to the goal. However, that is the exact opposite of what Kaiser does as he starts to sprint to the Manshine City defenders. As Isagi is able to get a closer look at Kaiser, he notices something. He sees that Kaiser isn't looking at the ball at all. He's twisting his neck to see everything and instead of the ball, his field of view is what he's doing. As this is going down, Ness has just gotten off a pass to Kaiser, and when I say that almost the entirety of Manchin City goes to block Kaiser, I mean it. However, even though 5 players are there to block him, he still manages to find a little place where he could send the ball in. And that's exactly what he does, and Kaiser's outstanding shot goes into making it even, and also showcasing the real power of Kaiser's impact. Everyone is surprised by Kaiser's immense powers, he even got Chris Prince to shake a bit. 
After that, we jump right into Isagi's thoughts as he says that even if he wanted to learn Kaiser's impact, he can't as it's unique to him. What he instead should try to pay attention to was how Kaiser found that shot course faster than anyone, and most importantly, how he arrived there faster than anyone. However, Isagi isn't all too clueless and knows that the reason is undoubtedly the way he uses his eyes. As we go straight into a science lesson by Mr. Yoichi, he says that humans have two types of vision. The first one is called central vision, and it directly perceives something in a direction. The second one is called peripheral vision, and it's like low resolution images that are outside the central vision. And when it comes to football, in order to perceive the entire field, every player, and the ball while in motion, it's important to be able to absorb as much information as possible from your peripheral vision. Because if you focus too much on the ball with your central vision, you lose information on the scene around you. So when it comes to your surroundings, your decision making speed is delayed. Even so, knowing that when one has to dribble and pass while running at full speed, they'll end up focusing too much and narrow on their field of vision. And therefore, it's likely that Kaiser is constantly inputting new information that he gets from his peripheral vision. By constantly renewing information about both friends and foes, he knows who is doing what and where. And by then, having that overwhelming amount of information, he's able to arrive at the best point that no one else could understand. And when you compare it to the world which Isagi sees, it's like Kaiser's world is from a higher dimension. If the state of the field is a 2D image, then the image of a play that one player can visualize would be something 3D. And when each player moves around, using only their own images, it can cause misses and tears at the seams, and having a vision yet above that, which can visualize every image and destroy them. Isagi then states that you could say that Kaiser's brain and eyes are a four-dimensional vision, a godlike vision that stands above that of everyone else, which we know as metavision. By taking information from a lower dimension like Isagi has been doing, he could never win against Kaiser metavision. Spatial awareness, perception, and football IQ, only by overlapping all of this, is Kaiser able to attain and discern information from his 4D vision. And by then, connecting that to the Kaiser impact at the end, he's able to become an exceptional striker that can create goals. Meta vision combined with Kaiser impact is Kaiser's golden rule. Isagi now understands it perfectly, but how can he use it to fight? Since he doesn't have Kaiser impact, the weapon he could use instead is a direct shot. But what about meta vision? Isagi has just now come across it, but he's sure that he's probably done it before. The first goal he scored in blue lock, and all those situations where he could smell the scent of the goal, one of those moments where he was alone and was able to catch the distortion between Rin and Sei. All of those plays were only possible because of his own eyes and brain transcending everyone else's on the field. But does this mean that Kaiser keeps it up for the whole 90 minutes? No, that can't be right. But if it were, then it would be like becoming a god. Then suddenly, Isagi understands it perfectly, that if he combines metavision and direct shot and creates a new formula, he would still need a bit more than that. But if he was able to actually implement this, then he would realistically be able to beat Kaiser. But why stop at Kaiser? Because with this image, he could possibly defeat all of them. After that, we finally get out of Isagi's mind and back to the field, where Kaiser approaches Isagi and asks if it were fun stalking him. He asks Isagi if he finally understands that his plays have become filled with despair and that they have left him speechless. Isagi stays quiet for a while before he says no and thanks Kaiser as he's finally able to see hope in crushing him, which is straight up one of the coldest things he could have said. And with that, the game restarts and it's finally time for Isagi to try out his new meta vision. This time instead of just focusing on one particular player, he will now use his peripheral vision to see the entire field and gain more and more information on what's happening to then finalize it in his head. Isagi is able to see that his teammates are more wary of Nagi's movements now. He also sees that Chigiri is rushing to the side to await his next pass. Even so, Isagi isn't able to see a breach but still feels this sensation as a rush. Isagi alongside his new metavision is able to gather more information than he's ever been able to do before. It's as if there's a new brain circuit upon him. After that, Isagi takes in everything that is happening on the field and is able to foresee Manshine City's next move which is to pass to Nagi. However, Isagi was able to decode this attack and was able to reach the pass in time. Everyone is stunned and even Agi says that Isagi is different from before and with the ball at his feet, he starts his attack. Hiroi is on the bench watching the situation break down and says that it looks like Isagi is having so much fun, kind of seeming jealous. Isagi teams up with Corona once again and starts their comeback. Isagi is able to see the best path for them to break through Corona and Isagi manage to break through Ryo like it is nothing, and Isagi isn't even 100% there as he's in his metavision. 
He says that Kaiser is still behind him and that now is their time to attack. As Corona and Isagi break the ankles of another Manchine City player, Isagi was that he needs to minimize the time it takes for him to trap the ball, and instead use that time to look at his surroundings and to constantly sense more of what's happening on the field. Isagi gathers information on a level that he never could have imagined, and even says that his brain won't stop working and that he's amazing now. Corona and Isagi are still continuing their vicious ankle breaking and demolishing the Manchine City players. He gets closer to Kunigami and is in the perfect position to pass to him, which would probably lead to a goal. However, Isagi instead uses him as bait and gets into a shooting stance, but as he's about to shoot, Corona comes and takes the ball of Isagi's foot, which lets Isagi get to an even better angle to score from. Corona runs to the ball and even states that he's having trouble keeping up with the pace which Isagi is moving in, but he still manages to reach this pass and pass it forward. Isagi sees the ball coming and says that it's the perfect position to shoot, he goes into his direct shot position and is about to score a wonder goal, but from out of nowhere, Kaiser comes and cuts off some of Isagi's shooting angle. This doesn't stop Isagi, who still shots the ball right under Kaiser's balls. It seems like the ball is about to go in, but just then someone else appears, and no, it isn't someone from Manchine City, because it's once again his own teammate, but this time it's Kunigami who comes and steals away the goal, making a wonder goal and giving Isagi an assist on Bastard Munchen's second goal. Isagi is furious saying that he doesn't need some fucking assist and tells Kunigami to go to hell. And when he's at his lowest, Kaiser comes to him, saying that he shouldn't have shot that shot, saying that he definitely wasn't in a good position and that Isagi must love giving out assists. Kaiser words open up a new and honestly scary Isagi who tells Kaiser that he will fucking kill him even if it's the last thing he does. But Kaiser just asks him if this is his new way of saying that he loves him. However, someone that is impressed is the man himself, Noel Noah, who compliments Isagi and says to not let this break him because this new weapon he's got will be the ticket to Isagi becoming the best in the world and that it might even lead him to Noah. Even after Isagi still isn't done with his rant as he says that his scoring formula was perfect and without flaws. However, Kaiser was able to foresee the same thing and decided to interfere with the plan which then lead to Kunigami stealing his goal. Isagi is sure that Meta Vision is an outstanding weapon. But just as he learned it from Kaiser, other players can probably acquire it if they have great football knowledge and awareness. Not to mention that if one is a midfielder or a player maker, they'd probably scan the field the same way he did and then find the best pass routes and shot courses. And then he thinks back to the U20 game, where he says that Sei most likely already used MetaVision against the Blue Lock 11. This is a new height for Isagi, as it might just mean that he's broken into the next level. However, suddenly, his body starts to wear off and he almost falls to the ground, saying that using MetaVision brains away lots of his physical and mental stamina. Even so, Isagi knows that he's gotta surpass Kaiser, and if he doesn't crush him, then he can't show the world his value as a striker. After that, we see Ryo, who takes a look over at Isagi, and says that Isagi is more and more becoming like a monster. After that, Ryo thinks back to the time Nagi chose to go with Isagi instead of him. Ryo says that he never wants to be the guy who doesn't get chosen and wants to avoid experiencing that feeling ever again. Ryo says that it wasn't Nagi's fault and that it was him that needed to change. He ends it by saying that he needs to show the world that Ryo can fight by himself. But just then, Nagi comes forward telling Ryo that he wants to beat Isagi. He tells Ryo that right now, he doesn't have a chance of beating Isagi and asks Ryo for advice before telling him that soccer isn't fun anymore. Ryo tells Nagi that he doesn't care anymore and that this is the path that Nagi himself chooses. But after that, Nagi tells Ryo that playing alongside each other was fun. And when Ryo is just about to walk away, Nagi ends it by asking for Ryo's help. Ryo stops himself and asks Nagi if he ever thinks about others' feelings. He tells Nagi that he had to crawl up without being chosen many times over, and when Ryo finally decided to keep fighting and get stronger on his own. That's when Nagi wants to come back. Ryo tells Nagi to stop talking to him, as if he can manipulate his feelings with Nagi's every changing feelings. But Nagi tells Ryo that he has gotten it all wrong. He tells Ryo that ever since the day Ryo invite him to play football with him, Nagi has always been by his side, and that Nagi always kept making the best choices to make their dream come true. He tells Ryo that the two of them couldn't beat Isagi before, but now it's a different story, as both of them have gotten stronger. Ryo asks Nagi what his ego is, and Nagi tells him that it's his dream, after that, Ryo tells Nagi that he is a real pain before telling him to play soccer together. And with that, the game is back on. Agi has the ball and looks over at Isagi before saying that Isagi's movements have clearly leveled up from before and that in this game, he is slowly becoming the eye of the storm. 
Agi also says that he wants Nagi to awaken and to take the next step, but he doesn't get to say much more as Kunigami goes to block him. Agi tries to move Kunigami's center point to get behind him, but it doesn't work that easily. Isagi takes a look at the field and says that right now is a bad idea to move as Chigiri, Ryo, and Kaiser are all standing by, and that if he included himself, it would go into a 3v3 situation. But just then, Isagi remembers the time between Noah and Lavinio, when Lavinio used Isagi as a tool to get behind Noah. Chigiri screams to Agi to pass him, but Isagi tells him that he moved too soon. As Isagi is going to steal the ball, he meets with Kaiser, who also had the same idea as Isagi. Quick moment of silence for Agi, who just fell to the ground. Anyway, Isagi now knows that he made the correct decision, and that his vision is in the same dimension as Kaiser. The loose ball falls to Ryo, and Kaiser orders Ness to go and steal it. With Ness coming up behind Ryo, he is forced to pass to Nagi. Ryo copies Itoshi Sa's pass to make a 1-2 with Nagi, who uses his back hell to get the ball over to Ryo. Agi goes over to Ryo and asks what he is doing. He tells Ryo that he isn't supposed to use Nagi in Ryo's own ideas, because if he does that, then Nagi's creativity won't flourish, but Ryo just tells him to shut up. Ryo is set on devoting his newly evolved chameleon style to help Nagi score. Ryo also thinks it can be his gateway to enter his flow state, and with Nagi and Ryo once again teaming up, they are looking more dangerous than ever before. Isagi knows that to beat Ryo and Nagi, he will have to use Metavision to predict the best place for them to reach. Corona goes forward to stop Ryo, but is faced with some crazy hyperspeed scissors, which lets him pass. After that, Nagi and Ryo uses their 1-2 passes once again to break Bastard Munch's defense. In the middle of their attacks, Ryo takes a moment to think back. He thinks about Nagi, the guy who was unmotivated and who thought that everything was a drag, who now says that he has a dream. Ryo thinks back to when they split up. Ryo admits that he was frustrated and that he resented Nagi, but he still had resolved to move on by himself. Ryo ends it by thanking Nagi and says that if they are together, they can achieve anything. Ryo passes the ball to Nagi, who jumps up and makes a double trap with his chest and leg. After that, the ball goes to Ryo, who right off the bat passed it back to Nagi, who once again shows off his crazy football abilities. But behind Nagi, waits for both Kaiser and Isagi, who read both Ryo's and Nagi's movements. But Nagi isn't faced as he passes the ball back to Ryo. Ryo has to decide if he wants to pass it behind Isagi or Kaiser, but in the end, he knows that there is only one way they can go, and that's behind Kaiser. Leaving Nagi with Isagi, Nagi traps the ball as it's going down, and he pretends to shoot, but Isagi was able to see through it with his meta vision. Isagi thinks that Nagi will do a two-stage fake volley, so he tries to stop him from getting into his position, but when he does so, he realizes that Nagi wasn't going to do a two-stage fake volley, but instead a regular fake volley. Kaiser goes to block Nagi, but ends up getting hit by the same move Nagi used on Isagi. Isagi says that he can still manage to reach Nagi, but when he goes in to take the ball, it doesn't end too well for him. As he gets hit by another one of Nagi's fake volleys, as the ball is up in the air, Nagi thanks Isagi and tells him that he is now the best player in the world. He jumps up and shoots the ball into the net, making one of the craziest goals ever. As Nagi hits the ground, he screams out of happiness. Ryo also runs to him and makes a high five with the genius. As Nagi is walking, he says that he finally won and that he finally beat Isagi. After that, he says that winning sure feels good. After that, Isagi goes over to Ryo and Nagi and says that he finally understands what makes the two of them tick and that a goal like that was born of things like the springtime of youth. However, there is no value in success if you can't reproduce it, as Isagi says that he will crush the two of them and that there won't be any more miracles for the two of them. However, the two of them gladly took up Isagi's challenge and after that, it was time for something incredible, with Chris Prince joining the match. Niu gets up and looks happy. He asks Chris if he is going to help the team at its final moment and become a mentor for them on the pitch as he should. However, he couldn't be more wrong, as Chris only wants to score the final goal and become the hero of this match. Chris compliments Nagi's goal, but turns to Ryo as he asks him if he didn't want to become the best player in the world alone, and asks if he has already given up on that ideal. However, Ryo says that it doesn't matter anymore, and that his real dream is winning the World Cup. He's fine with Nagi becoming the world's number one, if it means that Ryo can be his right-hand man, and Blue Lock is just a steeping stone for the sake of his dream. Chris asks if that's his new ideal, but Ryo denies that, and says that that's his ego. Suddenly someone else joins their conversations. It's Noel Noah, who is getting up from his seat and is ready to join the fun. From afar, we have Isagi looking at the two masters, as he says that with Noah and Chris, the field is bound to change, and Isagi has to sort out the situation so that he can take over this match. 
This is the first time since acquiring Metavision that Isagi was able to have all of his abilities evolve exponentially. But even then, it wasn't enough to beat Kaiser. Isagi's speed and overall body movement are slower than Kaiser's, and on top of that, Isagi doesn't have Kaiser's impact. Even if Isagi uses his direct shot, Kaiser will just show up and stop it with his meta vision. The final piece Isagi needs in order to beat Kaiser is to have at least one thing where he can overcome him. However, it's not only Isagi who is analyzing the field as we see Yukimiya in the distance. Yukimiya says that he hasn't accomplished anything and that he has just run around like an idiot on the field. Even though his vision is fine, it is getting a little blurry. However, Yukimiya can't be worried about that right now. Because if this match ends like this, he won't get another chance. And with one goal left, both Yukimiya and Isagi are determined to be the ones to steal the last goal. Noah tells the team that he will ally himself with whoever plays the most logically, while Chris tells the Manshine to watch him become the hero. And with that, the game starts with Kaiser passing his guard dog. Isagi thinks about what Noah said and knows that with these last three minutes, he's got to be as calm and precise as possible and live up to Noah's expectations. Kaiser and Ness pass around for a bit before Chris goes up to Kaiser, says that he has heard great things about him, and asks him to show him what he is made of. However, Kaiser doesn't fall for Chrissy's childish trick and passes it back to Ness before Chris calls him a coward little boy, which makes Kaiser really angry as he demands Ness to pass him and challenges Chris. The duel is really close with both players playing at their peak and not leaving even the smallest of gaps, which makes it impossible to interfere. Chris taunts Kaiser some more, which leads to him facing him right on, starting with a double-touch nutmeg before they go back to back. With that, Chris somehow got the upper hand and told Kaiser that he really was just a small fry. However, just then, Noah comes forward, and he will reach the ball first if it weren't for our favorite Ryo Mikaj, who comes in and tackles the ball away. Isagi is stunned at how Ryo managed to react to all that, and says that Ryo is starting to attain his meta vision. Anyway, the second ball falls to Chigiri, who easily gets behind most of Bastard Munchen's defense. As he sees his zone, he says that it's game over, but unfortunately for him, Yukimiya comes and runs his fun. As he says that it's time to defang and declaw him, and with that, all of the strikers assemble in Bastard Munchen's goal area. Chigiri makes a fake shot to get behind Yukimiya, who couldn't keep up with Chigiri's tricks. But just as Chigiri is about to shoot, Kaiser comes from behind, ruins his balance and says that he was too slow. However, before Chigiri loses the ball, he makes sure not to waste it as he passes to Chris. Chris is in his zone, and he is going to need that if he wants to defeat Noah. Noah tells Chris that there is nowhere for him to shoot, but Chris just smiles. As he tells Noah that he has designed a weapon specifically made to break Noah, Chris chips the ball over both Noah and Kunigami. But that's not all, because they quickly realize that the ball is a knuckleball. Chris screams at his shot to go and says that he doesn't even know where it's going. Gagamaru is stunned. He has no idea where his shot will land, and says that there's no way that he can stop this incredible shot. However, just then, the goat himself, Isagi Yoichi, comes closer to Gagamaru. Gagamaru notices that Isagi isn't even looking at the ball, but before he can think any further, Isagi screams for him to go low while he takes high. And with their teamwork, they were able to block Chris's shot. Isagi's save shocks Chris to his core, but Isagi thinks that it was easy to read. Even though it's impossible to read the shot's trajectory, Isagi could still read which point was the most vulnerable, and if he could just defend that spot, they would be fine. It was a huge gamble, but it paid off in the end, and Isagi has now devoured the world's number two, as he says that it's his turn. The ball goes up in the sky, and Isagi screams for someone to take it, and who else would it be if it weren't our favorite shark boy, Corona? Isagi thinks that he can finally see it. Ever since Chris and Noah entered the game, the field has been a lot more chaotic and even Kaiser wouldn't be able to fully understand the current situation yet. If Isagi can hit them with an all-out counter right now, with Corona's help, there's a big chance that he will be able to score. This is Isagi's golden opportunity, but just then someone comes and steals the ball. However, it's not anyone from Manshine City, but instead Yuki Miya who comes in and sweeps the ball away from Isagi. Isagi asks Yuki Miya what he is thinking, but Yuki Miya tells him to shut up. As he runs, saying that this game is his, and that he is running out of time. Yukimiya gets behind both Chigiri and Ryo with ease, but before we can continue with Yukimiya's carnage, we get a flashback. Yukimiya has finally gotten his glasses and asks the doctor how they look on him. The doctor assures him that they look great and that the treatment is going smoothly as well. He tells Yukimiya that his eyes haven't gotten better or worse and asks him to be patient. Yukimiya smiles and says that he has finally come to terms with his diagnosis 
as he says the phrase, God will never give us more than we can handle. And that's why Yukimiya believes that God wouldn't have given him this condition if he didn't believe that he would be able to overcome it. As he breaks through all of the no-names of Manshine City, he says that the golden opportunity finally came. When he has gotten through six of their players, he gets his chance to shoot, and he doesn't hesitate as he shoots an amazing gyro shot. The goalkeeper says that the spin is abnormal as it drops and fades away, and that he won't be able to reach it after that. But just then, someone else comes into the picture, and it's no small fry, as Chris comes and kicks the ball away, and ends it by calling it pathetic. After Chris's incendiary display, we see Henri and Igo talking, with Henri calling Yukimiya's shot close, and saying that if it had gone in, Yukimiya would have scored a super goal. However, Chris Prince isn't someone to underestimate. After that, Igo says that for Yukimiya to definitely score, he would have needed to juke the last two defenders, and also win in a 1v1 duel against Chris himself and by that time, the rest of the defense would have caught up, meaning that the chance of Yukimiya scoring was 0%. And if that wasn't enough, Igo says that he's glad that Chris blocked it, because if the shot had gone in, the after effects would have been disastrous in the long run, just like the last goal. Henri asks Igo if he's talking about Nagi's goal, and Igo says that it was a shitty fluke goal. Henri is stunned and says that Nagi's goal was amazing, and that it's already blowing up on social media with headlines like Nagi Seishiro is the best player in the world, and that goal is already the best goal of the century, Igo is surprised and says that all he felt from it was a sense of foreboding, and says that it's impossible for Nagi to ever replicate that goal again. Nagi's talent is off the charts, but even for someone like him, it went a little bit too well, and with attaining success above your talent level can have a dangerous after effect. He says that Yukimiya's result was to be expected, and the reason he failed was that he thinks too highly of himself. Henri asks him if that isn't a part of being a striker. However, confidence and delusion are two completely different things, and success won't come to people who blind themselves with deluded fantasies. After that, we are back in the game, and Isagi goes forward to Yukimiya and tells him to stop fucking around. If Yukimiya hadn't gotten in his way, he would have had a good chance of scoring. After that, Isagi sees Yukimiya's face and calls down. He even compliments Yukimiya's shot. And after that, he asks Yukimiya to team up with him. Isagi says that since they know about the gyro shot, they'll be on alert for it, and that's why, for this game, they will use the gyro shot as a decoy. While Yukimiya sends Isagi an assist, since the Manshine City hasn't seen them link up, it'll catch them off guard, and with Yukimiya assisting Isagi, their chances of being used in the next game will dramatically increase. However, Yukimiya tells Isagi to fuck off, and says that he made it very clear that he will be the hero of this match and that he will overcome this challenge all by himself. However, this really upsets Isagi, who starts screaming at him, and she tells Yukimiya to get over his own pride and that this is the most beneficial for both of them. But Yukimiya just asks Isagi if that's the same thing he told everyone before devouring their fantasies. In the end, all Isagi cares about is himself. And with that, Yukimiya finally understands that Isagi and Kaiser are a pair of self-centered shitheads, and if the world is only going to reward asses like them, then this world is just fucked up. After that, Isagi says that even in this situation, Yukimiya is filled with nothing but childish thoughts. And if that's the case, then Isagi wouldn't want to live in a world with a deluded narcissist asshole like yourself, as he ends it by telling Yukimiya to watch his precious fantasy sink straight to hell. The game restarts with a throw-in from Bastard Munchen. However, Isagi still can't get Yukimiya out of his mind, as he wonders why he and Yukimiya can't just understand each other. Isagi is pissed that Yukimiya outright rejected his offer, even though it benefited the two of them. However, Isagi knows there's no way that Yukimiya will fulfill his wish, as he is so self-centered and thinks that he is the protagonist. But just then, something clicks for Isagi, as he thinks back to Nagi calling himself the protagonist. The belief that you're the protagonist, and the drive to accomplish something, are all forms of egoism. However, just as it's happening, Yukimiya once again takes the ball from Ness, but Ryo quickly comes to stop him, which he does with ease, as he takes the ball away from Yukimiya. Isagi says that while he tried to understand others from his own point of view, in doing so, he forgot to look at things from their point of view. And then he finally understood that everyone is their own protagonist, and with that, he looked back and said that it was obvious that he and Yukimiya couldn't see eye to eye, because their individual feelings of egocentrism override one another, and Isagi was unconsciously making him a side character in his story. And if the two of them continue to think of themselves as the protagonist, they will never be able to score. However, that stops now, as he has found his last piece while he will grasp while using Metavision. 
After that, we see Ryo comfortably demolish Bastard Munchen's defense as he says that his body has become super sharp. His thoughts and movements are going at a super high speed, and Ryo feels invincible. With this new power, he can even end this game. Chris, AGI, and Chigiri is all headed to the goal. However, all of them are his sacrificial pawns for his treasure to shine. Grim comes in an attempt to stop Ryo, but Ryo knows that he is so close to his destination that he powers through a bit more. But just as he is about to pass to Nagi, Isagi comes from his side and kicks away the ball. The ball goes up, and it sadly falls to Chris, who gets accompanied by Noah, who does some crazy moves to get the ball away once again. This time it falls to Chigiri. However, Chigiri can't advance any further as he is blocked by Corona, so he has no chance but to pass to AGI who gets manhandled by Kaiser. And I don't know how Manchin City is so lucky, but the ball once again falls into their hands as Ryo is completely free in the box. Ryo says that even God decided to become his ally before shooting an outstanding shot. However, it's going to take a bit more than that to defeat Gagamaru, who uses his ultra-fast reflexes to save the ball. However, it was secretly a pass to Nagi, who traps the ball right in front of Gagamaru. And when all hope was lost, a hero came to the rescue, and who else would it be if not Isagi, who steals the ball from Nagi, who stole it from Gagamaru? A real tongue twister. Isagi has come to the conclusion that if he can analyze everyone's egocentrism, and then calculate where those egocentrisms intersect, he will be able to crush those miraculous goals. And then, in the end, he will be the main protagonist. Isagi looks for the best scoring option but is quickly shocked as most of them are cut down by the Manshine City players. But just then, Korna came forward, telling Isagi to use him as they started their countless one-twos with each other. Isagi knows that what he is lacking is the necessary physical ability to utilize Metavision at its full power, and if he can just level up his abilities a tiny bit, he will reach the next level. However, that's not possible right now, as he's too weak, and just then Ryo goes to block Isagi, telling him to just try to get past him. Isagi is quickly losing hope, but just then, he finds a new light. As the man himself, Noel Noah tells him to go, and that he has decided to ally himself with Isagi. Isagi is shocked that Noah has decided to ally himself with him, but quickly goes back to reality, as Noah tells Isagi to get more creative and increase his options. This opens up a whole new world for Isagi, who is now seeing multiple options. Noah asks him if those options can be achieved realistically, and Isagi says that they can, and that he has no doubt about it. However, he tells Noah that he sees too many options and that he can't pick the best one. Noah tells him to get rid of the unnecessary ones and to think more logically. He asks Isagi what he desires more than anything right now, and Isagi coldly tells him that it's to destroy Kaiser. However, it's not only Noah who is here to help Isagi, as Corona also comes to join in on the fun. The three of them play with the Manshine City team as if they were a bunch of kindergartners, even handling Chris and Kaiser with no problem at all. Isagi says that this feeling of flow that he is experiencing is completely different. The mental state of being fully immersed in one's own actions, aka protagonism, is the key to activating flow. And with that, Isagi asks all of the protagonists in this game to come to him and be devoured. After that, we leave Isagi for a brief moment as we focus on Yukimiya. As he looks at Isagi from the sidelines, he is filled with envy that Isagi is even getting help from Noah himself and wonders what it is that Isagi has that he doesn't. However, deep down, Yukimiya knows that what Isagi is saying is realistically correct, but if he wanted to think realistically, he would have given up a long time ago. Yukimiya's dream is to be the best football player. It's the only way he knows to live and is the sole reason that he is alive. Yukimiya doesn't care for Isagi anymore, as he will be the one to send him to hell. Following that, we see that Isagi is in a bit of a rush as he only has 19 seconds left before Noah will be forced to switch out. However, he will make their last play with Noah worth it. As Isagi gets closer to his goal, we see Ego with his pretty little toes out, telling Isagi to show them how it ends. Back on the field, Isagi and Kaiser are going head to head, and just as Kaiser is about to steal the pass from Corona, Noah comes in his way. This makes Kaiser freeze for a second, and Isagi doesn't let it go to waste. As he slips behind Kaiser, However, the foe just keeps on coming, as Chigiri uses his incredible speed to catch up to Isagi. But ultimately, he catches the biggest L I have seen in a while, as Isagi takes him down with ease. After Chigiri lies Nagi, who gets hit with a fake shot from Isagi, who instead passes to Corona. Isagi is so close to scoring now, but just then, Yukimiya comes beside him with a really menacing look to him. Yukimiya thinks that he will hijack Corona's course with the help of his speed but he quickly realizes that he has just played right into Isagi's hands. 
As Isagi gets behind him and tells him that he is the final piece to the puzzle, Corona gets ready to pass Isagi, and at that time, Yukimiya finally understands that there is no way for him to catch up to Isagi, as he says that Isagi will definitely become a player that will change the world while his fantasy will fade into complete obscurity, forgotten forever. After that, we see that Chris has finally come to join the fight, as he tells Isagi that he wasn't good enough. However, Isagi is confident, as he says that Chris's opponent isn't him, but instead Noah. Noah manages to get the pass forward to Isagi, as he asks him if even the world's number one is a pawn in his game. And here we have it. Isagi will finally score, is what I would like to say. But unfortunately Kaiser comes in the way, and runs off Isagi's center point, making him unable to use a direct shot. However, Isagi tells him that it's perfect, and if Kaiser hadn't come, Isagi would have been the protagonist. But since he came, the one Isagi plunged into darkness will resurrect from the verge of death, as he passes the ball to Yukimiya. Before we can see what happens with Yukimiya, we see Isagi asking Kaiser if he was able to predict his last play, as he grabs onto Kaiser and asks him how it feels to be the clown in Isagi's story. Even Kaiser is scared, as he tells Isagi that he is nuts. After that, we finally get back to Yukimiya, who shoots a killer ball. And it's not just any shot either, as it's Yukimiya's specialty, the gyro shot. However, Ryo is also headed to the goal, and just as he is about to reach the ball, it drops down to the ground, evading Ryo's leg, but also bouncing up to the top of the net. With that, Yukimiya brings glory to Bastard Munchen as they finally win the game with a close 3-2 score. Both Yukimiya and Isagi are over the moon about their goal. After everyone has arrived, Yukimiya goes forward to Isagi, and they start a staring contest before Isagi tells Yukimiya that he is sorry. Yukimiya looks happily surprised as he tells Isagi that if he hadn't passed him, he would have been finished. Yukimiya also apologizes for the terrible things he said before, but Isagi tells him that he needed Yukimiya's strength in that last play. Isagi tells him that to beat Kaiser as a playmaker, he simply used Yukimiya as a tool, and that everything was going according to plan, except for the end. Because Isagi didn't expect Ryo to come in charging as he did, but despite that, Yukimiya managed to score a super goal, and Isagi tells him that was his win. Yukimiya asks Isagi how he managed to draw up that crazy last play. He also asks Isagi if he didn't draw it up so that Isagi could be the one to score the winning goal. Isagi tells him that he would have scored if Kaiser hadn't gotten in his way. Kaiser saw what Isagi was up to and efficiently moved to crush his goal. Isagi also says that right now, he can't beat Kaiser in a straight up battle, and that's why he passed to Yukimiya his own trump card that only he had envisioned, and it was all to destroy Kaiser. And of course, to show the world that Isagi was the best player on the field by far, Yukimiya is shocked at Isagi's ability to think this far ahead, and he tells him that he is a real pain in the ass, and that he is far too clever for his own good. However, he admits that Isagi was without a doubt the man of the match. Isagi tells Yukimiya to keep on being that same Bream-obsessed idiot that he has always been, and to not even dare become a player, which Isagi can simply manipulate. Yukimiya smiles and says that this twisted relationship suits them before giving each other a high five, and saying to each other that they will devour each other until only one of them is left standing. Ness sees this and thinks to himself how disgusting this is before telling them that they are wrong and that a striker would never pass in that situation. He tells them that all this about destroying Kaiser is false and that Isagi just couldn't hack it, so he chickened out and went with an assistant. Isagi calls Ness Kaiser stupid lackey and tells him that he simply couldn't understand his last play and asks if he should dumb it down for him. Ness gets furious before Kaiser comes and shuts him down. Kaiser compliments Isagi and tells him that in the last play in that split second, Isagi saw further into the future than he managed to do, and tells him that this match is Isagi's win. However, he also tells him that this time he had Noah backing him up, and that the next time they fight, it will be without Noah backing either one of them up, and ends it with saying that they are both strikers, and to see which one of them scores the most goals. When he awaits Isagi's response, he can see Isagi falling to the ground. So he lets Ness go and catches Isagi by his hair. Yukimiya is in shock, and Noah asks Kaiser what's wrong, but Kaiser just tells him that he is overheated. Kaiser tells him that he has recklessly pushed past his limits and calls him the goddamn egoist, which sounds pretty cool. With that, Neo Egoist League Match 3 is finished. Isagi wakes up and sees Noel Noah cooking up some tea as the waifu he is. Noah tells Isagi that he collapsed and had slept for 10 hours before offering him some water. After that, Noah asks Isagi if he were able to dethrone Kaiser, as he said he would. 
Isagi thinks back to the game and says that he was able to dethrone Kaiser for at least a moment. So naturally, Noah asks Isagi what's next. So Isagi chugs the precious water he got from his idol and tells him that he will defeat Kaiser with goals. And when Noah asks Isagi to verbalize how he plans to do that, Isagi says that he can see it and tells Noah that he learned to use his eyes and brain in the last game. Isagi tells Noah that he calls it Metavision and explains it to him. He says that he takes shots of the entire field at once, using his peripheral vision, and then from a bird's eye view, he makes decisions and reads the flow of the game. However, that alone wasn't enough because Isagi realized that each person has their own protagonism, and if you can crush that, you can lower their level of performance. However, on the flip side, if you can link up with an ally's protagonism, you can create a chemical reaction. After that, Isagi apologizes for not having his thoughts organized yet. But Noah tells him that it's fine and says that he wants to know what Isagi is thinking, which brings a smile to Isagi's face as his idol has finally approved of him. Isagi says that now he has to train the skills he is missing and that he wants to score next time. However, here comes the interesting part because Noah says, so that's why he chose you. This makes Isagi a bit confused before Noah tells Isagi that the way he thinks about football, Noah has heard it before from a teammate over 10 years ago. Noah's first ever rival and the worst kind of football fanatic, and now the creator of Blue Lock, Igo Jinpachi. And this is incredible, but Isagi is shocked that Noah knows him and asks him how they know each other. And Noah says that they were comrades in arms, and now that Noah is the best in the world, Igo is obsessed with the world's best. Anyway, after that, Noah just blue balls us and goes on telling Isagi that the next annual salary bidding auction was held while Isagi took his nap. However, I will only talk about the interesting ones. So first we see Karasu with 12 million yen, which is kind of a steal if we are being honest. And then we have my boy Nico at a steady 14th with 23.5 million yen. However, after that, we got Corona and I am so happy to see him here. Anyway, we also have Aiku at 27 million yen, Gagamaru with 28, Yukimiya with 29, and Jigiri with 30. Noah says that those who played in matches and of course those who scored are highly rated, but also those who create many chances and dominate the midfield. As we can see here with Ryo at 40 million yen, and after him comes Kunigami with 47. However, forget everyone else because here comes our favorite poster boy, Isagi, in 4th place with a 50 million yen offer, which actually is the same as Ness has. Some comments Isagi got from social media were that the next generation Modric is here and that the heart of Blue Lock is truly Isagi Yoichi. However, after Isagi comes Bachira, who got a 66 million offer. Bachira also scored a goal in the match between Italy and Spain, which was parallel to Isagi's match. Anyway. After Bachira comes to Nagi with an 88 million offer, which he definitely deserves. But now the one who scored a hat trick in the Italy vs Spain match is none other than Baru, which is insane. Baru got a 100 million yen offer, and on top of that, he scored a hat trick. After that, Noah casually tells Isagi that their next match is against the Ubers, and that match is gonna be insane. After that, we get to see that an interviewer has come to the blue lock. The interviewer's name is Nihei Susaku. And if you think back to some of the first chapters of the series, you will remember that this is actually the guy who interviewed Itoshisai in the beginning. Anyway, Nihi asks this mysterious player, who really isn't that mysterious, how it feels to have garnered such praise and attention. After being awarded the Man of the Match award in the Bastard Munchen vs Manshine City match and also receiving an offer of 50 million yen from Bastard Munchen, this player is also considered by many to be the eye of the storm in the new generation of footballers. And after that, we see the mysterious player. And would you look at that? It's Isagi Yoichi. Anyway, Isagi tells Niehi that he is very thrilled to think that an average high schooler like him would be given this golden opportunity to have his skills shown to the world. Isagi says that thanks to Blue Lock, his life has changed so much. Niehi thanks Isagi for his great answers and then thinks that Isagi is a really nice kid, easy to work with, and totally different from Sei. Anyway, Nihi continues with the questions and asks Isagi about the offer from Bastard Munchen. He reads up on some comments that one of Bastard's scouts gave after the match. The scout said that he would like to pair up Isagi with Noah and also says that Isagi is a new type of versatile midfielder who's skilled in both offense and defense. After that, Niehi asks Isagi how he feels about these comments. Isagi thinks for a bit and says that he is glad that a club like Bastard Munchen thinks so highly of him as a midfielder but Isagi wants to survive in this world as a striker, denying the speculations of Isagi becoming a midfielder. However, Isagi doesn't stop there 
as he says that even if he can act as a creative outlet in the midfield, he wants to do so as a striker, because Isagi wants to win by scoring goals. Call it egotistical, but this is something that Isagi will not yield to anyone. Niehi thanks Isagi for his straightforward answer, and thinks that an egotistical mindset that aims to devour everything that he desires, and says that this is really the football philosophy of a blue lock player. Anyway, after that, Niehi thanks Isagi for their interview and tells him that he can't wait to see what kind of player he becomes. Right as Isagi leaves the room, he is greeted by both Kurona and Igarashi, who have both been eavesdropping on him. Anyway, both of them tell Isagi that his interview was super lit, and that he and Nagi are trending like crazy on social media. While they are standing and talking, Raichi comes out of the shower, kind of making fun of Isagi, and also making fun of Igarashi and Kurona. But let me just say this, I am fine with people slandering Igarashi and even Isagi, but when it comes to Corona, it's strictly forbidden. Because just look at him, he is even doing his infamous shark pose. So yeah, I have big problems with Raichi from this point on. Anyway, after that, Raichi is about to just casually walk, so Igarashi stops him, asks him what's wrong with praising someone who did something incredible, and tells Raichi to stop being so goddamn stubborn. Raichi waits up and says that right now, he is the honest person in the world, and tells them that he is really frustrated. Isagi is a bit shocked before Raichi continues and says that the weakling that was with him on Team Z is now one of the most prized young footballers in the world. He tells Isagi to watch as he drags him down and takes the number one spot. And Isagi is just his regular happy self and tells Raichi that he can't wait for it. Anyway, after that, Igarashi also bounces as he says that he has some trading to do and runs off saying that he will become a superstar. Isagi turns to Kurona and asks him what Yukimiya has been up to. Kurona asks him if he hasn't heard, and asks him to follow him. After that, we see both Yukimiya and Chris doing a photo shot, where it looks like they are doing a commercial for a pair of sunglasses, as they are heavily promoting them, which just looks fun for some reason. Chris tells Yukimiya that he is really good at this, and says that firstly, it was only going to be him in the commercial, but after watching Yukimiya play, Chris personally asked them to cast them together. Yukimiya thanks him, and says that it's an honor working with him. However, Chris tells him that it's fine and starts complimenting Yukimiya's insane goal against Manchine City. Chris also says that in addition to being a good player, you need to be popular too, and says that not to brag, but that he can work with anyone when it comes to this, which is essentially just bragging, but whatever. However, Yukimiya asks Chris if he was the right choice, and asks if it wouldn't have been better with Isagi. He did become the man of the match after all. But that awakes Chris's inner demon as he says that he will never forgive him for ruining his moment to show the world that he is the number one player in the world and not Noah. Anyway, it's fine, because after Chris is done, he says that he isn't mad or anything, so we have to trust his words, right? After that, Chris tells Yukimiya to see each other at the next World Cup and asks Yukimiya to tell Isagi to be there as well. When they are done, Henri comes and tells Yukimiya that Igo wants to see him alone. Yukimiya enters Igo's room, and Igo starts telling him that when you overwork yourself, black spots appear, and once your vision becomes blurry, sadly there's no current way to cure that only one way to slow down its progression, and the sickness is called optic neuropathy. Igo turns around to Yukimiya, and asks him how long he was planning to hide it from him. Yukimiya is shocked, and right away apologizes. He tells Igo that he didn't tell him because he doesn't want anyone to feel sorry for him. The Ego understands and tells Yukimiya to speak freely as he isn't recording his conversation. Ego also says that he isn't some vulgar trash who would release people's private information to others. Yukimiya once again apologizes for not telling Ego, however Ego says that he already knew about Yukimiya's condition and that he always runs a background check before you enter Blue Lock. Ego just didn't see any point in bringing it up until now and with that, Ego goes into the real matter at hand. He tells Yukimiya that he has already sent all of his medical data to the club that sent him the offer and says that it's only natural for him to have a pro contract. And that's to be expected when clubs offer this huge sum of money. It's only right that we report any injuries or illnesses. Yukimiya is quiet, but Ego continues. He reads up what the club responded with. The club said this, We would like to help Yukimiya with his treatment. We will pay for the entire treatment. That's how much they value his talents. So please play for us. This heavily shocks Yukimiya, but he still stays quiet, so Igo talks some more. Igo says that it's still uncertain whether Yukimiya's eyes will fully heal, but that the club is willing to do anything it can to support him. Igo even says that offers like this don't come very often, and asks Yukimiya if he is going to accept their offer. Yukimiya tells Igo that he can tell them to wait while he makes his final decision, 
even though he is very thankful to Ajax for making such an offer and that he normally would have accepted it without any hesitation. However, Yukimiya doesn't feel like he deserves this offer because he was only able to shine with Isagi's help. And if Yukimiya decides to accept this offer now, then he feels that this is as far as his ego is going to grow. And that's why he would like them to wait until the Neo-Egoist League is over before deciding how valuable Yukimiya is to them. Ego says that he understands. However, he tells Yukimiya that there's no guarantee that this offer will still be standing here waiting for him. And Yukimiya says that he understands, that he will no longer ask God for miracles, and that he will now change his destiny with his own hands. After that, we get a single panel of Hiori, who sits on the ground and says that football is tiring. After that, we get to see a big picture of baby Hiroi and his two parents. His dad was a silver medalist at the All Japan Judo Championships, while his mother was ranked second in Japan in the high jump. With their parents having tasted the bitter feeling of always finishing second, they made it their mission to make their child a champion, and that became his destiny as soon as he was born. From a young age, Hiroi's parents pushed for him to become the best, with his mother taking care of his health and making sure that he ate right. To his father pushing him onto more training and studying tactics, everything they did was for Hiroi to become the number one in football, the most popular sport in the world. His parents even put him in an intense elite training program, and the only thing they talked about was how he had gotten better and how he could become the best. But in reality, Hiroi wanted to spend more time with his friends. But with his parents' big smiles, he couldn't say no, so he made sure to always make them happy, and so he continued to play football. Hiroi thought that his parents loved him, but that all changed one night when he woke up to his parents screaming. His dad is yelling at his mom that his numbers aren't high enough and that it's her job to take care of his diet. His mom tries to define it and says that it might be his teaching methods that are the problem. This makes Hiroise's dad furious and he says that at the rate Hiroise is developing, he won't become a pro. After that, Hiori's mom wonders why she even married him in the first place as he is a total asshole. To end it, they said that they had entrusted Hiroi to fulfill their dreams and that if Hiroi can't become the number one in the world, then they want a divorce. This shocks Hiroi, who suddenly loses his balance and falls down the stairs. His parents rush to his aid right away. When they come to Hiroi, he asks them if it's his fault that they are getting a divorce, but they just ignore that and ask Hiroi if his foot is broken and call an ambulance just to be sure. However, they aren't doing this out of love. They are just doing this to make sure that their dreams don't die. And Hiroi notices that as he says that his parents aren't even looking at him, his parents don't care about him, they only care about his talent. But despite everything, Hiroi kept on playing football even though his parents didn't love him, because as long as he kept on playing football, his family would stay together. And then one day, he will become the world's number one striker, but he still wonders what his true purpose is in life. Because after all, Hiroi chose to live his life according to a character description, and his life became easier as a result. After that, we fast forward to after a training session, where Karasu Tobito, who was playing along with Hiroi, comes up to him and calls him remarkable. Hiroi thanks him, and Karasu introduces himself. He says that he is one year older, but he still plays for Bambi Osaka Youth. After that, Karasu even tells Hiori that he is a genius, and that Hiori is born with impressive physical ability and superb ball control, combined with a high football IQ, and not to mention Hiroi's left leg, which Karasu calls erotic as hell. And dude, I completely agree with Karasu. However, in the final third, Hiroise's passion in front of the goal is just average, and Karasu says that it's as if his mind and body aren't in sync. And Karasu asks Hiroi if he truly loves football. Hiroi tells him that he is right, calls Karasu amazing, and says that it's really obvious to some people. However, Karasu quickly says that in Hiroise's state, he doesn't stand a chance against him. But Hiroi hits Karasu with another question, and asks him if he likes to have huge expectations forced on him. Karasu is confused, and Hiroi tells him that all his life, Hiroi's parents have just forced their expectations on him, and says that that's probably why he doesn't truly love football. However, when Hiroi is done, Karasu just says it's boring, and tells him to just think about it later. And to start with yourself, and to believe in yourself, he tells Hiroi to find something that truly gets his blood pumping. Hiroi stands still, and wonders what he is supposed to believe in. Besides, he doesn't even want to play football, and if his parents weren't around, what would he really be doing with his life? Hiroi just doesn't get it, and when his parents come to him to show his invitation to Blue Lock, he thinks that he would like them to stop, and calls them disgusting, and kind of envisions them fading away while he says, not to heap expectations on him ever again. And when the day comes for Hiori to go to Blue Lock, his parents are excited, and tell him that they are routing for him. But for Hiroi, the Blue Lock is just a place to escape, 
as he says that he never wants to live in that house again. After that, we get back into real time, where Isagi comes to Hiroi and asks him to help him practice, and Hiroi agrees. After that, we get into a steaming hot bathtub scene with Ryo and Nagi. Ryo is ecstatic over being worth 40 million yen and asks Nagi how he feels about being worth a stunning 88 million yen. Nagi tells him that it's unreal, but asks Ryo why he's so giddy when they lost their last match. However, Ryo tells him that it's because Nagi is blowing up on every social media thanks to his incredible goal. But Nagi just says that it's kinda lit, which is such a Nagi response. After the bath, they sit down, and Nagi tells Ryo that he honestly can't picture himself becoming the world's best striker. All this time, he's been playing to beat Isagi, and when he finally did it, it felt like a dream. And because of that, he feels like it would be impossible for him to aim to become the world's number one, as he isn't really a motivated guy to begin with. Ryo tells Nagi that it's probably because the challenge of becoming the world's number one is too far away, which makes Nagi lose motivation. But then Ryo remembers that Nagi had said that he just wanted to play video games all day and not work, and because of that, their new goal should be to earn 300 million. As the average lifetime earnings of a Japanese male is around 300 million, and that's why they are going to go wild in the Neo Egoist League and raise Nagi's value to 300 million. Then Ryo gets a possessed look at him and goes on a little rant about capitalist men. When he's done with his rant, he asks Nagi if 300 million is a good goal. Nagi says that it seems doable, but he also says that all of this reminds him about the first time he asked Nagi to play football. Nagi had no idea that he would become so passionate about something and thanked Ryo for introducing him to football. Ryo can't believe what it is that he heard coming out of Nagi's mouth and quickly asks if he's okay. However, Nagi ensures him that he's okay. But Nagi's speech motivated Ryo, who now says that it means that they aren't done yet and that they should aim toward winning the World Cup and becoming the world's number one. After that, we move over to the bastard Munchen side, where Kaiser is going over the last goal. Ness comes forward and says that he admires his hard work, but that he should at least use his blue light glasses. Kaiser thanks him before telling Ness that he's always managed to crush all of the clueless rookies, second-rate veterans, fading superstars, and you could even say that Kaiser is his happiest when he's crushing other people's lives. But even so, it's something about Isagi that he can't seem to beat, and even says that in the last game, Isagi definitely surpassed his expectations. Ness tries to defend Kaiser right off the bat, saying that Isagi gave up on trying to score, and therefore Kaiser is better than him. Kaiser then splashes his drink on Ness, and says that he already knows all of that, but why is it that Isagi still dares to defy him? Kaiser showed Isagi their vast difference in strength and broke him multiple times. But even with all that, Isagi keeps getting back up like a zombie. It's as if the more obstacles that are in his path, the more excited he gets, and he even manages to clear all of his obstacles by the skin of his teeth. Ness goes back to his rat ways and says that it doesn't change anything and that Kaiser is still superior. However, Kaiser ignores Ness's slick talk and asks him why he chose to come to Blue Lock. Ness tells him that he's here to either prove he's Noah's equal when playing alongside him, or use the Neo Egoist League auction system to win an even bigger offer and then use it to force his way out of Bastard Munchen. And for once in his life, Ness is right. Anyone with half a brain knows that Bastard Munchen is Noah's team, and in a Noah-centric system, he's just a secondary character, and because of that, it's impossible for him to become the world's best striker. And that's why he chose to participate in the Neo Egoist League to boost his brand. But now Isagi has managed to grow to exceed Kaiser's expectations. Even so, if Kaiser manages to devour Isagi, he will then manage to skyrocket in popularity. Kaiser has a fearful look as he tells Isagi that he's finally big enough to eat and starts shouting at his screen like a 14-year-old Fortnite player. Ness then leaves, and when he's just gotten out of the room, he slams himself against the wall, furious while biting his lips, saying that Kaiser is now more interested in someone other than him, and curses out Isagi. While Ness is busy idolizing Isagi, he is out training with both Igarashi and Raichi, and of course, Igarashi is the first one to fold. After that, he does someone touches with Corona and can keep up fairly well. After that, it's time for some off-the-ball training, and he manages to completely outplay Yukimiya and score, which shocks everyone at how much Isagi has improved. Isagi sits down, and Hiroi throws him a water bottle, asking him if he's using Meta Vision. Isagi says that it's amazing to use his peripheral vision to scan and read the entire field, comparing it to the reflex theory that Hiori told him about before. His only difference from then is that his body couldn't keep up with his thought process. Hiroi tells him that from an outside point of view, it looks like Isagi is just exploding at an incredibly fast rate, but for Isagi, he's just steadily leveling up. They talk about the last game, 
and Hiroi tells Isagi that from the bench it looked like his playmaking and moment were off the charts and says that it was like Isagi was manipulating every single player on the field. But not only that, but with his egocentrism, he has been able to perfectly read everyone's mental state. Also saying that it was no wonder Yukimiya felt that Isagi was a godlike game master in that last play. When Isagi hears those words, he instantly compares it to the field he first had when facing Rin. And not only that, but he managed to do it in the Neo Egoist League, against the world's best. However, even if this training is a success and Isagi manages to successfully level up, there's still only a 40% chance of him winning against Kaiser. Hiroi is amazed that Isagi can visualize that far ahead and tells him that if that's the case, then he's fine. However, Isagi says that it will never be good enough as long as it isn't 100%. In the last game, he was only able to play freely because he had Noah supporting him, but he will never become the world's best if he keeps relying on others. And to finally be able to score a goal with 100% certainty, he's still one piece short. Just then, he overhears Igarashi and Raichi. Raichi is furious that Igarashi just keeps on diving for fouls, and Igarashi just tells him that it's his new techniques, which allows him to draw fouls on anyone who dares to challenge him from his right side. Their conversation makes Isagi's pieces scramble. Hiroi is laughing at how dumb Igarashi is, but Isagi tells him that this is perfect, saying that with his formula, he can destroy Kaiser. He runs faster than he's ever run, and on the way he thanks Igarashi. And Igarashi is right off the bat, scared that Isagi will take his foul technique, which is just so funny. Yukimiya goes towards Hiroi and says that Isagi just keeps on evolving and evolving. And Hiroi is even saying that he's a bit envious, saying that he also wants to be able to love football the way Isagi does. As Isagi is running, he says that he can definitely win with this, however for him to master it until the next game will be hard. Even so, there's one player who can help him. He goes into the training room and goes to Kunigami, saying that he needs his help. After that, we fast forward five days into the future to when it's time for Noah to announce the starting 11 for their game against the Ubers. Noah starts with the goalkeeper who is going to be played by Gagamaru. After that, we have the two center backs, which will be Mensa and Birkenstock. On the right back, we have our favorite shark boy Kurona. And on the left, we have Yukimiya. And then, for the defensive middle fielder, and possibly the key to this match, is none other than Raichi himself. Saying that during their training sessions, when it came to dueling, he has able to really hold up his own. This makes Raichi ecstatic as he turns into some beast-like creature. After we move on from Monster Raichi, we have Ness, Grimm and Isagi taking up the midfield, which leaves Kunigami and Kaiser as the final strikers. Noah explains that the Ubers are an Italian team and that traditionally they've been a strong defensive team. Their master Snuffy is a strategist with the goal to make an intelligent and crafty team. Noah tells the players to expect them to deploy various countermeasures that will aim to destroy. The two key players on the offense will be Kaiser and Isagi, and the key to destroy them will be to destroy their defensive game plan. After that, Reichi starts pipping up and says that he will do his job to crush everyone in the midfield while Isagi and Kaiser focus on scoring. Noah then says that to win this match, they have to win important one versus ones, making this match a test to see how they do in 1v1 duels. Noah then tells Kaiser not to get to fixated on Isagi, as Noah won't tolerate Kaiser's irrational and illogical plays anymore, ending it by telling them that if they are a striker, then they will have to prove it by scoring goals. The bastard Munchen players start to walk out, but in the hall, Kaiser reminds Isagi that it's whoever scores the most goals that win, and tells him not to run away. After that, they get out on the field and meet up with the Ubers. The Ubers greet Isagi, and all of them are ready for payback, but the one who's the most fired up of them all is Baru, who goes to Isagi and straight up headbutts him. Isagi notices Baru's red highlights right off the bat and calls him out for it, calling him a narcissist. Even so, Baru says that he's proud over them and that he put them in to celebrate 100 million while calling out Isagi for only being worth a pity of 50 million. But the Ubers players quickly come to ruin Baru's pride as Aiku says that Baru suddenly wanted to pump himself up before facing Isagi. Baru quickly denies those claims and says that he suddenly wanted to go for a different look. However, Aryu and Nico add on with Aryu saying that he's like a girl before a date and Nico calling him Princess Baru. And because of that, they end up in a headlock by Baru, you know, just the typical Baru. Aiku then tells Isagi that the ones who'll be sitting on the blue lock's throne will be the Ubers and that just sounds so cold. After that, we get into the blue lock central monitor room where the chairman of the Japan Football Union comes in and tells Ego that Blue Lock Television is amazing and that they are making tons of money. He shows Ego a bunch of mascots he made, but Ego just smashes them into his face. 
Ego asks if that was all he came for, and the chairman says that it was. However, he also reminds Ego about the promise he made when he approved Blue Lock Television. And I'm so curious to know what the promise was, and if you have any guesses, then please leave it down in the comments. Back on the pitch, Isagi is thinking to himself, saying that he knows what he needs to do, and that he put in the necessary work during training. All that's left is for him to prove that his theory works in the actual game. And with that, the kickstart of the match starts. Kaiser and Ness trades passes to start it off like always. And as they are doing so, Isagi is looking at them from the side, saying that Uber's formation is an ultra-defensive formation that's tightly packed in the center. And even if they manage to shake their marks in the 1v1, the other Uber's players will immediately press them with two or even three players. Kaiser comes to Nico, and Nico thanks Kaiser for making Isagi stronger. After that, Kaiser passes to Ness. However, Ness jumps over it and lets it roll over to Grimm. After Grimm has gotten the ball, that's when Ness starts to run all that he can, moving all the way to the front. It looks like the ball is going to Ness, but in reality, he's just the bait for a much bigger fish, which of course is Kaiser, who's currently battling Nico. Isagi is amazed that they were able to break Uber's formation by making Ness make a run from the midfield. However, as the ball falls to Kaiser, another one appears. He cuts off the pass with pinpoint accuracy, and that's when we get to know that it's the heartbeat of Uber's defense, and also a next generation World Eleven by the name of Don Lorenzo the Ace Eater. Isagi says that Lorenzo managed to instantly catch on to Kaiser's unpredictable attack, and then positioned himself perfectly so that he could shut it down in one move, calling Lorenzo's vision, positioning, and physical ability all top notch. Kaiser tells Lorenzo to stop laughing, and that every time he shows off those golden teeth of his, it pisses Kaiser off. Lorenzo ignores that, and asks Kaiser if he's worth more than 300 million yen, if he managed to shut Kaiser down. Kaiser just calls him a creepy, gold-toothed loan shark, who only seeks people as money, which Lorenzo responds with a quote saying that there's nothing in this world that money can't buy, showing us his obsession with money. Then Lorenzo starts to brutally just point at everyone saying how much they are worth. Kind of rude. However, after that, he asks them if they are ready for their counter-attack. Lorenzo is about to pass a long cross-up on the field, however Kunigami comes to stop him, but ends up with broken ankles by Lorenzo, who beautifully gets away from him, only to find Raichi behind. Raichi tells him to just try and get past him, however Lorenzo kind of owns him by calling him worthless, as he's worth absolutely zero before doing some crazy ninja moves to get behind Raichi. Lorenzo makes a one-touch with Sendo to get behind Yukimiya. Igarashi gets up from his seat and tells them to do something to stop Lorenzo. Beside him, we have Hiroi, who's carefully watching the field saying that this is really bad. On defense, the Ubers string together consecutive presses and funnel their opponent towards Lorenzo, who lies in wait on the back line, and as soon as Lorenzo steals the ball, they make a switch. This makes it into a flexible system, where Nico drops back to play centre-back, while Lorenzo participates in the attack. They use their large number of players to their advantage to attack all at once, and create a long-range zombie counter-attack. Lorenzo goes into a shooting stance and baits that guy that I forgot the name of. Corona goes to stop him, but Hiroi thinks that it's a mistake, and that the second they focus too much on stopping Lorenzo, they lose track of the one player who absolutely thrives in these situations, which of course is the king himself, Baru Shue. Hiroi says Baru and Lorenzo together make a system where the two kings of offense and defense combine forces, saying that this is Uber's goal-scoring formula. However, before the ball can even get to Baru, someone stops it. And who else would it be, if not Isagi Yoichi? Isagi takes the ball and makes some really cool slide on the ground, but he says that it's nice to finally see the trick behind his hat-trick, before saying that he will be taking the ball. Even Lorenzo is shocked that he's only worth 50 million. Isagi now has the ball. While running away from Baru, Isagi says that his body is now able to keep up a lot better with his thought. We can assume that Isagi went through some intense training with Kunigami before this match, as Isagi went to Kunigami for help some chapters ago. After that, we get these incredible panels with pieces flying everywhere, and Isagi saying that it's time to score of the counter-attack. And who else would assist Isagi if it weren't for our favorite shark boy Kurona, who alongside Isagi trades passes. Yukimiya is looking at the duo from afar as he says that attack with a counter-attack of their own. With Lorenzo so high up the field, the Ubers still haven't organized their defense. And right now, Isagi and Kurona is able to steamroll through the field. It seems like Isagi has really worked hard to improve for this match, because his passing drills with Corona have really paid off. However, Isagi will get into some trouble, as Yukimiya says that he will change his target to him, and tells him to not take any hard feelings, as this is their team's philosophy, devouring each other to create chemical reactions. 
However, Yukimiya is once again catching another L as Isagi uses Yukimiya to get behind one of the Uber's defender. Yukimiya compliments Isagi and says that his dribblings have drastically improved. However, it's more than that because to get past the incoming defender, Isagi deliberately used Yukimiya as bait. Isagi finally has the thing which has been holding him down, a body to maximize his vision. As Isagi is running away, Yukimiya says that he is still evolving and that it's expected of his rival. After that, we see Kaiser, who has his eyes on Isagi and is probably thinking of a way to steal the ball away, but that quickly goes into ruin as Lorenzo blocks him. And I find it so funny that it's almost more players of bastard Munchen who is trying to get the ball from Isagi than the Ubers. After that, we finally get to see Nico, and I wish the author showed him more because I love his character. Anyway, he says that since Lorenzo is marking Kaiser, he won't be able to fall back. And if they get hit on the counter in this situation, their first priority as defenders isn't to steal the ball, but rather focus on slowing down their attack. A defensive formation designed to stop a quick counter attack by slowing down the pace of the game. However, their plan gets quickly thrown to the side, as Isagi isn't slowing down, but instead charging in. And Nico quickly realizes that Isagi and Corona knew that they were going to defend like this, so they have no choice but to challenge them in a speed battle. Isagi slips between Nico and Aiku and is now headed to the goal. Corona passes him, but just then, Isagi gets accompanied. And of course, it isn't anyone from the Ubers, but instead, his own teammate again. But this time, it's Ness who tells Isagi that in the event of Lorenzo getting hold of Kaiser, it's then his job to crush Isagi by any means necessary. He says that after studying Isagi's direct shot, he realized that it's trash, a defective shot that he can only shoot with his right foot. Ness has a smug look on his face as he says that once he knocks Isagi off balance, he's finished. But Isagi asks him to think again as he uses his left foot creating a lefty shot which goes right into the net shocking everyone. But most importantly, giving Bastard Munchen a one goal lead, the one who is most stunned of them all is Ness, who in shock asks Isagi what he did. After that, we can see different families all over the world being ecstatic over Isagi. However, I want to quickly focus in on this guy. If you have forgotten, then this was Isagi's first true fan. He came up to Isagi after the U20 match and asks him to shake his hand, which was so adorable. I really like how the Blue Lock authors keep on showing him in different places. It makes it feel much more special and reminiscing in some kind of way. Anyway, back to the game. Ness is almost too stunned to speak. His voice is shaky when he confronts Isagi. He tells Isagi that it's impossible, an unknown attacking pattern, and shot a direct shot with his left foot while there was no data on it. Ness is furious as he screams at Isagi, asking him what he's done in the last few days. After that, we go back five days in time, when Isagi went to Kunigami for help. Thanks to Igarashi, Isagi realized that his direct shot's weakness is that he can only shoot it accurately with his right foot. However, Kunigami became two-footed after he copied Noel Noah's physical abilities, and then Isagi asks him to teach him. Kunigami is a bit freaked out, calling Isagi clingy and disgusting. Isagi is still determined so he follows him and asks Kunigami to let him train together so that Isagi can study his body. Kunigami stops and says absolutely not and that Isagi will just end up destroying his specs. Kunigami tells him that he became two-footed to survive the wild card. Even so, it only worked because he had the necessary physical attributes to pull it off. If Isagi were to try copying Kunigami, he would end up bulking up in the wrong place and then lose his body's balance, meaning that there's only a greater chance that his performance will deteriorate. As Kunigami walks out, he tells Isagi to forget about shortcuts to become stronger, telling him that if he goes for that route, he's finished as a football player. Isagi thinks that Kunigami just warned him, saying that Kunigami is still a good guy after all, before going after him. As they are going around the corner, they meet up with Chigiri, who tells Kunigami that he finally found him. Isagi asks Chigiri what he's doing inside the German stratum, and Chigiri says that he came to see Kunigami saying that he basically ghosted Chigiri during and after the game. While Chigiri is talking to Kunigami, he just walks away telling him to piss off and that he doesn't have anything to tell him. However, Chigiri doesn't give up and speaks his mind. He says that he understands that Kunigami has changed. His playstyle and aura are totally different from before. However, it isn't only Kunigami who's changed. Chigiri tells him that from now on, he will be keeping an eye on Kunigami and asks him to do the same. But just then, another one sneaks his head around the door opening. It's Bachira who asks if this is some kind of class reunion. Before rushing over and saying that he will join in, he throws the football in Isagi's face. Bachira says that he saw the Bastard vs. Manshine match on the monitor, saying that it was awesome and that they were all dripping ego juice from their body. Now I'm not even going to try speculating what ego juice is, so let's just leave that to Bachira. 
He continues telling them that Kunigami's goal and Isagi's movements were totally insane, not to mention how crazy Chigiri's goal was. Anyway, he originally came over to ask Kunigami if they could train together. While this is happening, we can see Isagi cooking up some nasty piece for him to evolve. As he looks at Bachira and Chigiri and says that it's not like they totally changed their playstyle, Rather, they made minor adjustments that further maximized and enhanced their strongest weapons. So maybe there's no need to change everything. Isagi was too hung up on being two-footed, while what he really wanted was to customize his weapon for his left foot. While Isagi continues to level up his primary weapon, the direct shot, and if he can manage to just acquire a secondary weapon, then it will complete everything. And after that, the four of them start a 2 vs 2 match against each other, which makes me so nostalgic back to the start of the series when they really were acting like this. After that, we are right off the bat greeted by Aiku, who looks at Isagi amazed. He says that a lefty direct shot is amazing, calling it a cheat code. However, it's impossible to become two-footed in just a couple of days, meaning that Isagi's lefty shot has to have some kind of weakness to it. Lorenzo goes forward toward Isagi, pointing his finger at him. He says that he's taken a liking to Isagi and that he definitely isn't worth 50 million. He tells Isagi that he's now considered an ace like Kaiser, and the man himself, Isagi, coldly tells him to be sure not to pick the wrong guy to mark, ending it by calling Lorenzo a zombie bastard. After that, Lorenzo walks past him with a menacing aura, telling him to not get cocky after scoring one lucky goal, also making some kitty noises, and I'm all for it. He smiles and tells the Ubers that it's time to get to work, and with that, the game restarts. Isagi thinks that it's time to focus, try to steal the ball again, and go and score his second goal. But he quickly realizes that Lorenzo isn't moving up. As Nico and Sendo are trading passes, Isagi notices that the speed of their offense is slower, saying that they're prioritizing possession and slowly inching their way up the field. It's like they are waiting for the right time to flip their switch. However, Isagi says that as long as he can manage to keep track of Baru's heavy offensive, he can manage to devour them. Just then, we get a flashback to the first time the players met Snuffy. Both Nico and Sendo say that he's a very carefree and laid-back master. Before they start, Snuffy has a question prepared. He asks the players what football means to them. Sendo is first up and says that it's his dream. Aryu quickly comes after, saying that it's everything, and Aiku says that it's something he could bet his entire life on. But when Snuffy then asks what they would do if they couldn't turn pro, the players get silent. Snuffy continues, asking them what they would have if football was taken away from them saying that there's nothing wrong with devoting yourself to football. Even so, injuries and setbacks do happen. So what would they do if one day, for some reason, they were no longer able to play football? They still stay silent, and Snuffy tells them that those who can't answer this question will forever be dreamers and amateurs. However, for a professional, winning is both a duty and an obligation. Through winning, they are able to earn money and put food on the table. And then he tells them what football really is, saying that football is a job, nothing less, nothing more. He tells them to think of clubs as corporations. Based on that, games are business deals, and the players are employees. Snuffy then says that he's taken the liberty and time to study the data of every single player. Everything from the game plan, offense, defense, and situational football, and all of the various strategies now lay right in front of them. Sendo is right off the bat ecstatic, saying that it's amazing. Meanwhile, Aiku asks Snuffy if he managed to come up with all of these strategies himself. He did, and says that if they remember all the strategies he came up with and execute them flawlessly, they will win. After that, we see that the players under Snuffy's command are almost acting like soldiers. Before we leave the flashback, Nico has some additional comments to make. He says that all of Snuffy's strategies make full use of their individual capabilities. Snuffy even prepared different variations depending on the lineup. Then we get a rare panel of Nico showing his eyes. Let's be honest, these panels are becoming like rare Pokemon cards that you have to capture. Anyway, he says that if they manage to survive here, then they will without a doubt be exponentially stronger, which pumps out all of the blue lock players. And with that, we get back into the intense game between the Ubers and Bastard Munchen. Up to this point, Isagi has carefully studied Baru's movements and found the perfect place where he can intercept. He goes up, and as he thought, he easily gets the ball. But just then, Baru commands the players to get Isagi. Sendo, alongside two no-names, goes for Isagi's neck. Isagi is caught off guard, saying that a high press happened the second he managed to steal the ball. However, it doesn't stop there, as it's a multi-coordinate press as well. Sharkboy tries to help, but is of no use, as Isagi has no time to use Metavision. And just then, Nico comes in and sweeps the ball away. 
telling Isagi that he fell for their trap. As Nico is running away, Isagi is left behind, thinking about what just happened. Was the whole sequence just a part of their plan? Attack slowly through low-risk strategies, and if the opponent manages to steal the ball away, steal it back right away with a fast, coordinated high press. And after regaining possession, take full advantage of the short counter. Finally, he says that it's like all of those 11 players are one huge organism. And to end it off, we see Snuffy with his big-ass nose, telling Ubers to advance. And they do just that as they are coming in full force against Bastard Munchen's defense. The Ubers are passing the ball between each other so much that Gagamaru has no idea who it will be that takes the final shot. But in the end, the ball falls to Baru. Gagamaru is sure that he will shoot, and Yukimiya even comes to back him up. But to their surprise, Baru actually passes to Nico, who then makes a switch with Sendao. But suddenly, the ball falls into the midst of it all, and Gagamaru can't see anything that is going on, making him clueless as to who has the ball. But then suddenly he sees the ball going at the goal. But you know how Blue Lock likes to do it, so we jump straight into a flashback before we are able to see what actually happens. As Snuffy was having his speech about football being a job, Baru suddenly walks away and calls it a weak philosophy, saying that he didn't come here to play a weak-willed brand of football. Even as Baru is leaving, Snuffy just says that he's interesting. After that, we get into the training field where Baru is training his shooting skills. As he's training, Snuffy comes by and tells Baru that his physical specs are top-notch, saying that Baru is the most suited striker in the Ubers, and therefore Snuffy asks him to even if he's faking it, just try his football philosophy. However, Baru is getting secondhand embarrassment from Snuffy. Baru tells him that he refuses, and that football isn't a job for him, but a way for him to become a king. After that, he's going to conquer the world his way, and that's why if Snuffy wants to utilize him, he has to adjust to Baru's philosophy, which I'm not even sure if he's got one. Snuffy just starts to laugh before quickly taking the ball from Baru, which shocks him. As Baru is trying to take the ball back, Snuffy tells him that before he was a footballer, he was just a person. And if you can't understand the difference, then he's just an amateur after all. Snuffy just keeps on embarrassing Baru as he shouts about becoming the world's number one striker. Then Snuffy throws in a curveball and says that there was a time when he was just like Baru, getting by life solely off his talent, and alongside him, he had his best friend. Together, they took full advantage of the wealth and luxuries that come with becoming a superstar player. They fully believed that they were going to be kings of the football world, but they fucked up. They skipped training and their skills diminished, suffered injuries due to overwork, and then lost their place in the starting 11 followed by several scandals. However, when a man falls, it only takes an instant. Baru screams and asks what some loser story has to do with him. Snuffy tells Baru that finally his spirit shattered, and his best friend killed himself. This finally makes Baru shut up, as Snuffy asks him if he will be able to love himself. When he's no longer viewed as a genius, Snuffy tells Baru to value his life and once again asks him to work together to succeed as Uber's next king. However, even then Baru refuses, saying that he isn't like Snuffy's friend who killed himself, and that he doesn't want a crown that's been handed down to him. As he leaves, he sees the whole Uber squad listening in from outside. Aiku is shocked at Baru refusing Snuffy's golden opportunity, while Baru is shocked at how they can believe Snuffy's crap. Baru then goes into his meditation room, where he puts on a relaxing forest, however it quickly gets changed to a movie by Lorenzo, who comes in with a bag of popcorn. Lorenzo tells Baru that Snuffy has taken an interest in him. Even so, Baru isn't concerned by it, and is more concerned by Lorenzo spilling popcorn on the floor. Lorenzo says that Snuffy wins trophies for every team he plays for, and that's how he gained the name as the crown messenger, however that's not the real reason why he plays football. The reason why is that he aims to win in all the big five leagues to then achieve the dream he once shared with his best friend. And the series he's left is the Italy League with the Ubers. When he's managed to win a trophy with the Ubers, he will move on to becoming a coach. And that's why he's looking for a striker to succeed him. Baru is still not interested in their offer, so Lorenzo tries a different approach, which is to show off his golden teeth while having a proud look on his face. Lorenzo tells Baru that he used to live in a shithole when he was little, and after his parents abandoned him, he survived on the streets by swindling people out of their money. He was on the verge of dying, but that's when Snuffy came forward to him and asked him to play football with him. Lorenzo didn't believe him, so he challenged Snuffy to give him golden teeth, which Snuffy did immediately. Baru is quickly getting bored and asks Lorenzo what his point with all of this is, and Lorenzo tells Baru that his point is that Snuffy isn't the type of guy who would abandon the less fortunate, and that he's crazy enough to give them a future. After that, Snuffy enters the room and tells them that it's time for training, and Lorenzo for some reason quickly turns into a dog. As they are leaving, Baru tells them to wait, and that he will work with Snuffy, not as his successor, 
but that he will become a striker that surpasses him, telling Snuffy that his job is to help Baru become the king of the football world, which was a deal Snuffy couldn't refuse. He tells Baru that from now on, the Ubers will act as his arms and legs, and that their strategies will only be centered around him. That's why Baru's job will be to refine and evolve his ability as a goal hunter, especially his 1v1s against the goalkeeper, starting with his mid-range curve shot from 28 meters, which are already top-notch however, that shot is easy to stop if one can figure out its timing and motion, and that it definitely won't work against a world-class goalkeeper. After that, we get back into the game, where Baru is moving swiftly around on the field. The players have now managed to block Gagamaru's view, which gets them a spilled second blind spot. However, by the time he realizes it, it will already be too late, as Baru has already managed to get away a shot against him, which flawlessly goes in and makes the scores 1-1. to -1. And let us just take a moment to appreciate how cool this panel looks, with both Sendu and Nico coming to celebrate with Baru. Baru looks with an intense look at Isagi, and asks him what's wrong, and wonders if that's all Isagi's got. On the other hand, we have Isagi over here who's totally mind-blown by Baru's goal, saying that the Ubers came up with a game plan designed to crush him, and as soon as they got the ball, they went on a furious counter. They didn't even leave a chance for Isagi to stop them, as they managed to execute their plan perfectly. However, it's more than that as they were in perfect sync, which isn't something that can be taught easily, and on top of that, the timing to know when to execute their plan, saying that it's impossible to pull this off without some hardcore training, as he finally understands that this is the backbone of the Uber's strength. But even with all that, it still doesn't fully explain Baru's shot, which Gagamaru didn't even have time to react to, but that means that they somehow threw off his timing, and if that's the case, then that means that Baru didn't shoot when he wanted to, and that he patiently waited for the exact moment they threw off Gagamaru's timing, and because of that, he was able to utilize his vision. And of course, with Baru's shooting ability, if he manages to throw off the goalkeeper's timing, it opens up a chance to mass-produce a goal at an efficient rate. And with that, Isagi realizes that Baru has managed to achieve a whole new set of eyes, which he calls the Predator Eyes. After that, we get to Ness looking at both Isagi and Baru, while being angry at himself that he hasn't managed to do anything this whole game. However, that's when Kaiser goes forward to him and tells him to stop with his miserable look, as he tells Ness that their true target is Lorenzo, and that if they manage to defeat Lorenzo, then they will win, and Ness gladly take up on that challenge. After that, we get to the superior duo, where Corona is asking Isagi how many more strategies he thinks that Ubers have under their sleeve. However, even Isagi has no idea, but he knows that to win this game, they have to stick to Noah's plan and focus on winning their 1v1 duels. And with that, the game starts again. Ness and Kaiser are passing around as always. Ness says that the two of them can dominate the defensive and middle third, however it's on the attacking third where it gets tricky. Even so, Ness will do everything in his power to help Kaiser score. But just then, Lorenzo goes to cover them. Even so, Kaiser says that they are fine, as it's a 2v1. So Kaiser passes Ness and sprints behind Lorenzo, awaiting a pass from Ness, which he gets, however someone else reaches it first. And that one is the stylish master himself, Aryu, who jumps up and heads away the ball. The ball is heading back to Ness and Lorenzo, but someone else interferes. It's Isagi who tells Lorenzo that he wasn't good enough. Isagi was able to see everything that played out perfectly. He says that in the full of this game's chaotic flow, He's able to take control of the 1v1 situations, and ends it by saying that his meta vision has gotten better. Even so, his happiness quickly comes to a stop, as Nico comes out of nowhere and kicks away the ball from Isagi. Isagi falls to the ground, and says that he's amazed that Nico was able to stop him. After that, Nico tells him that it's to be expected, that as his vision and football IQ are all top notch. However, the same goes for Nico, as he calls them two birds of a feather, which I can't figure out if it sounds cool, or just corny. Anyway. That's where it clicks for Isagi, as he thinks that Nico also has acquired metavision. However, when Isagi confronts Nico about it, and asks him if he uses metavision, Nico is suddenly confused, and asks what metavision is. Isagi explains that metavision is a specific way to use their vision, which lets them capture everything that's happening around them, with their peripheral vision, which then lets you simultaneously process and analyze everyone's movements on the field. Nico gets the hang of it but tells Isagi that all he did was track the ball while keeping an eye on his movements. And since he saw Isagi and the ball in a dangerous spot, he dashed forward, even though it meant going against their game plan. Isagi is shocked, thinking that Nico subconsciously used metavision, and that his brain and vision are gonna evolve to a whole new level. After that, Aiku comes by complimenting Nico's play. However, Isagi's teammate isn't as happy with him as Aiku is with Nico, as Reichi comes and shouts at Isagi for losing the ball. 
After that, Isagi tries to figure out how many of the players here can use MetaVision. He concludes that Kaiser, Nico, himself, and maybe Lorenzo are the only ones able to use it, as Baru has a different kind of vision. Isagi then quickly becomes Professor Isagi, as he tries to explain the different visions, starting with MetaVision. MetaVision grasps the overall flow of the game, and all the information that's circling within it. Since he can use it everywhere on the field, he pretty much has the ability to predict the future. On the other hand, Baru's Predator Eye is focused on the 1v1 duel with the goalkeeper for the sole purpose of scoring a goal. Even though they're both strikers, depending on how they use their eyes and vision, the information that they pick up, analyze and act on is completely different. And with that, he begins inputting all of his new information to probably use it in the future. But before he's done, Raichi and Yukimiya scream at him to stop spacing out and that the game is about to restart. However, Isagi is like fuck that and thinks some more before starting, as he says that on top of all that he went through before, both of their teams have two totally different philosophies and playstyles. Ubers plays like one huge organism, with their unity discipline and coordination, while Bastard Munson plays like a chaotic fluid, multi-faced organisms, which is being spearheaded by him and Kaiser. Everyone on the field understands this, and that's why they are probably thinking about their next move, and what's risky, and how they can make an impact. Finally realizing that this is how it feels to be playing in a world-class football game. However, that also means that the next play and the next goal will definitely be the turning point, and that the player who manages to tilt this situation in their favor will undoubtedly dominate this game as its game changer. While Kaiser is waiting for the game to start, he's thinking that Lorenzo is too much in the way, even saying that he's gotten stronger since the last time he faced him. Because of Lorenzo, Kaiser can't move freely the way he wants to, and right now, it's obvious that Isagi has a much easier time moving around. While he's thinking, Ness quickly comes running, asking Kaiser what they are supposed to do, but Kaiser just tells him to shut up, telling him to move as they have practiced, and to believe in Kaiser, because for him, nothing is impossible. And with that, Grimm finally throws in the free throw, and the ball is going to Ness's legs. However, right then, Kunigami comes in his way, and pushes him aside, telling them to not forget about the dark horse. Kunigami is running at full speed against the Ubers players, even styling on someone which honestly looks so clean. Isagi is looking from the side and says that Kunigami is planning on going solo. However, that's impossible with Kunigami's specs, and even if Isagi went in to help, he wouldn't pass him. Isagi has no choice but to try and steal the ball in the penalty area and says that he can see clearly what he needs to do, but Nico is able to do the same thing, which makes it troublesome. Nico is focused on always having his eyes on Isagi and says that this new metavision is amazing. Instead of solely focusing on the ball, and instead seeing over the entire field and catching every piece of information circulating within it, Nico notices that Isagi is aiming for the same spot as he is, and it ends up with the three of them going for the same spot. As they are going to the ball, Nico says that it's a 50-50 chance for him. However, the percentage quickly turns to zero as Raichi comes in his way and stops him. This gives Isagi the chance to sweep in and steal the ball. As he's running, he states that Nico's meta vision is still incomplete saying that he was too focused on predicting the future that he diverted most of his attention on tracking him and the ball, which made him fail to realize that Reichi has positioned himself behind him and was waiting to ambush him. Isagi gets away from them and sees that there are only two defenders standing in his way, and he gets over the first one with the help of Corona. However, out of nowhere comes Aiku. Isagi goes into his lefty shot position and is ready to fire off an outstanding shot when Aiku sees through his bluff and tells Isagi that his lefty shot isn't 100% complete yet and destroys his chance. Isagi says that he failed and that he couldn't score after all. Right when he is at the brink of defeat, Yukimiya comes screaming his name and tells him to pass him, kind of giving us a flashback to the Manshine City match. Both Aiku and Isagi are stunned. Isagi says that Yukimiya managed to fill in the space on the right which Kunigami left, complimenting his position and calling him a godsend. However, Isagi is still stubborn and says that he can still shoot but he quickly starts to think more thoroughly. He thinks that if he were to lose the ball here, then they would get hit by a counter by the Ubers. And with that in mind, he has no other choice than to pass, as it's the more rational option. Isagi sends an amazing pass, but as the ball is flying to Yukimiya, someone comes before him. It's the legendary defender Lorenzo, who says that he will be taking this pass. This really shows just how amazing Lorenzo really is. He was able to foresee what Isagi would do, and then went to stop him. Even so, his greed made him oblivious, as Kaiser comes before him and says that he finally took his eyes off his price. Kaiser also says that he's been waiting for this moment. 
Isagi is amazed and all of his thoughts start to lose grip as they fall out. Isagi says that Kaiser got him, saying that Kaiser managed to outread his entire thought process to then use him to get Lorenzo off him. Kaiser was able to see everything, and if that wasn't enough, then everybody out on the field got metadata. And can we just take one second to appreciate how cool that sounds? I can't wait till someone says that expression to Isagi. However, it still isn't just a free road for Kaiser as Sendo comes to stop him, saying that in these situations, it's his job to press. Even so, Kaiser turns into a cat and jumps over Sendo's leg. But Sendo's attack wasn't in vain as he bought Aiku and Aryu some time to come and cut off his shooting angle. Aryu comes from behind and flips Kaiser upside down, and Ness once again shows his real identity as a dirty dog as he's right away starting to complain and asks for a penalty. However, as Kaiser is in the sky, he tells them to eat shit and calls them losers before doing a Kaiser impact mid-air. Kaiser's shot bounces under Aiku and goes into the goal, giving Bastard Munchen a one-goal lead. Kaiser's goals are one of the most mind-blowing goals I've ever seen. It's definitely a top three for me. But please tell me what you thought about it in the comments. It kinda looks like Yukimiya's goal, but on steroids. Isagi is almost too stunned to speak after Kaiser's goal, saying that Kaiser managed to do a Kaiser impact in that position, and not to mention that he nutmegged Aiku off a kind of bicycle kick. With this high-level chess match and a player's rapid evolution, Kaiser by himself managed to destroy all that, saying that Kaiser is this game's ultimate game-changer. And that's everything that happened in the Neo Egoist League arc so far. And I don't even know what to say, as everything in this arc has been absolutely amazing. Everything from the FC Barcha game to the Manshine City game, and now the Ubers game which we aren't even finished with, not to mention the amount of crazy goals we got in this arc. We had Nagi's 5 stage volley, and Bachira's Ginga X monster style, and of course the latest one being Asagi's incredible lefty shot. But please tell me what you thought about this arc down in the comment. And if you like Blue Lock and videos like this, then I would highly suggest you subscribe to this channel, and while you are at it, leave a comment and a like as it helps out with the algorithm a ton. And if you are curious to see another one of my videos, then please watch the videos which will be popping up on the screen now. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye.